6 o'clock, I'll call the January 28, 2020, Glyph County Board of Supervisors meeting to order. Tonight we have Pastor Rick Lindemuth from West Union United Methodist Church to offer the invocation. If you would please stand and remain standing. Let us pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly ask for your blessings upon this meeting tonight. Bless our supervisors and county officials as they meet and consider the matters and issues before them. We acknowledge our human limitations and pray for wisdom and guidance in making decisions that will determine the future of Wythe County. Bless those who lead and serve our county. Bless those who serve in the police and sheriff's departments and firefighters and emergency medical responders as well. May God bless Wythe County, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and may God bless America. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the tonight's agenda is Citizens Time. Uh, first speaker we have is Mr. Jim Ennis. Good evening, everybody. Jim Ennis, living on Connors Valley Road, and I came here to talk about Connors Valley Road. I've been there for about a little over two years now, and this road is a, most of it is a dirt road or a <coughs> gravel road two or three miles along, I'm not really sure, I don't live out at the end. It's very, it's pretty treacherous driving on this road. You know, um, this thing is along a creek. And the, when it rains, it washes out. It doesn't happen once every few years, and it happens several times a year. It's really, really treacherous. I'll just tell you the story of the last, most recent incident, just a couple weeks ago. We had a big rain on a Saturday night, washed out the road, it was, we're impassable, so I gotta go somewhere. So I'm in my car driving down. Uh oh, debris in the road, big rocks, you know, big limbs and stuff that's coming down from the wash water. You know, the water's gone, but all the debris is left on the road. But you know, I'm trying to be careful and trying to go drive around, and I hit this stuff and I damaged my car. I suffered a lot of damage because it didn't clear it. So I had to get out of my car and get up and start clearing the road and picking this stuff up and throwing it over here just so I can get out of there. You know, this is not just <clears> one time. This road just, this happens a lot. Several times a year, I don't know if it's four or five times a year on there. I've only been there for two years, so, you know, I can't give you a long average of, but it happens a lot. Another thing that's about that road that's really, really dangerous and really hazardous is, you know, as the road gets worse and worse every time it gets washed out and there's the creek's right here and the road's here. Well, it gets washed out, washed out, and there's places where the creek is now come cutting into the road, you know. Last time, last couple of times it washed out, the VDOT put, a, you know, one of these big cones there. Oh, you don't want to drive over here, you know, because if you do, on this, you'll, you'll fall into the creek. It's about an eight-foot drop, you know. It's just getting eaten up, eaten out every time we have a big, another flood. You know, so I think there's two places between my house and on the way out. I don't know about other places further down there where there's treacherous things like that, where the, you know, the creek is eaten into the side of the road. And so it's probably something that needs to be addressed. You know, the road is really a mess. And as the school buses go down there, you know, and all kinds of trucks and UPS and FedEx and all kinds of traffic. It's not like I'm the only one on that street. <coughs> there's quite a respectable amount of traffic. But thanks a lot for the consideration. Thank you, Mr. Ennis. Thank you. Next is Mrs. Diane Ennis. Good 
evening. Diane Ennis, Connors Valley Road. Same thing, but I got two incidents to share. In October of <coughs> 2018, my brother and his, his wife, my sister-in-law, came to visit from Wisconsin. They drove all the way, and it wasn't until they got to Connors Valley Road that they ran into a flood. The water was over a foot deep. They had to drive on the pasture just to get past. Everybody was freaking out. My sister-in-law told me she's not coming to visit me anymore because of that road. And as my husband said, it doesn't happen just once in a while. Then in February of 2019, I was leaving in the morning. There was a gentle rain. I thought, well, I guess it's going to be OK. So I come back in the afternoon, and there's this big caution, high water sign right at the beginning of where the flooding was. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I called my neighbor who's lived there for a long, long time. And he said, look, just drive straight in the middle and don't stop. Go slow, but don't stop. Okay, so I'm driving, and my car takes this descent and it dips into the water. Whoosh, all this water goes out, and I think, oh my gosh, just go slow, go slow, keep going, stay in the middle. And thankfully, I knew where the road was. And I did, and I made it through, and I took video, if you want to see it, of the, all the washout flooding in this road. And it happened in what? Less than a few hours. So, yeah, it'd be nice if it was fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Paul Matthews. My name is Paul Matthews. I live on Pope Road. And uh, my concern tonight is uh, what has happened on their low water bridge that's nothing been said about it for a while. What's taking place on that? in the rebuilding it. And also, come off Powder Mill Road in the first grade up Pope Road on the gravel road, it's a ditch about that deep. About a month ago, the school bus got in the ditch. They had to come in and tow it out. That's how bad it is. Why is it up at one grade, it's about 100 yards long, that we can't get good sized gravel or rock put in that ditch and build a shoulder on the road instead of having just a drop off in a ditch. If you get off the surface, you're in the ditch. If you get in the ditch, you don't go nowhere. The car's on the bottom. And I would like to know why I can't get a couple of truckloads of gra uh, good sized stone, which would drain good and fill that ditch line up, that it won't be there like that. Because it's, it's bad. I mean, if you meet somebody on that grade, if you don't almost come to a stop and, and, and be real careful, if you get off that regular surface, you're in the ditch. And it's been several people that's been in that ditch and had to be towed out. And it ain't no good. I mean, it's no, it's no shoulder to the road, period. It's a surface in the ditch. And that's it. And another thing, our dream pipes on the road has never been cleaned out. They run the ditch line to the end of the dream pipe, and the dream pipe's full of gravel and dirt. No water goes through them. And I know, uh, according to what the plans are, about six months from now, the road's supposed to be blacktop. They probably will put new drain pipes in. But still, we got the problem with the drain pipes are now because when it comes to hard rain, it's no way to get the water away from the road, so it runs around, right down the road, washes across the road, ditch lines in the road, and everything else. It gets just like a rock break after a hard rain, then until then it's scraped and everything refinished, then you got a rough road to try to get over. So I don't know what your plans would be on that, on the dream pipe system right now, but it seemed like it, these pipes are supposed to have been cleaned out about two years ago and they ain't never been touched. And the county said they had to the equipment to do it with, but 
they show they must have lost equipment because they ain't done it. <laughs> but it's two things that needs to be done bad. The main thing is get that hill, that ditch line in that hill uh, shored up so that, uh, you know, people won't get in a ditch and have to be towed out. When the school bus gets in it and have to be towed out, that means that ditch is bad. And that has happened about a month ago. And it sure, I mean, it could cause a lot of damage, could cause injury to the children or whatsoever, you know. All depends on what speed they're traveling, whatsoever, you know. So, need to be done something about it. And then we've got Mr. Fowler being up here later on. Need to come out there and take a maybe, look at it. Maybe he'll give us a And uh, see exactly what I'm talking about. Because it ain't no good like that. I mean, you ain't got no shoulder. You've got the surface and a ditch. It's no shoulder. And, and a lot of places up that hill, two vehicles, they got to get slow in order to pass without, you know, getting out off in the ditch or something. So it needs to be something done about it. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cobb. This is Roy Cobb from Post Road. Today's his birthday. You got it, Mr. Falk. One of my favorite people to come to the meetings. Well, I come over here to get you to sing happy birthday to me. <laughs> <laughs> when we have that ribbon cut, when they lay the black top. Oh, okay, yeah. We'll see. I'll be there to cut a rusty in that black top too, buddy. But that's why I'm here for. I, I know it's, uh, you know about it and everything and promise. And we got a good man at VDOT now, and he promised me, so there ain't much I can say, but he's been taking care of the road no long as he's been in there putting gravel and scraping it and cleaning the ditches out so I know we got a good man we got some good guys up here that's going to take care of it y'all have a happy day happy Thank birthday, happy birthday, birthday sir. <clears throat> next up is Mr. Dean Cove Good evening to you all. My name's Dean Coe. I live in Murray, Virginia. I wanted to talk about your Expo Center. I was a subcontractor contracted to do all the inside work once the building was put up. Last July, I and all my help started getting sick. We had a bad fungus epidemic come into the arena. I stepped into this fungus and it collapsed both lungs. I lost 40% of my lungs. And I reported to Dr. Shelton in Murrian and uh, <coughs> labor board of this incident. And also Bill Vaughn and the head architect, David Shanks. David Shanks said he would look into it. Mr. Shanks approached Bill Vaughn about it and had lined up a laboratory to do the testing on this soil. Mr. Shanks was told to stand down, no soil test. We got our own soil test and turned them over to David, and again he was told to stand down. So meanwhile, <coughs> James Brown had over 100 seizures in that building. Uh, Mrs. Demise, her husband died from it. He was 51. No oxygen to his heart. <clears throat> and it attacks you, it gets you fast. I mean, you don't have a minute. And it got me a total of four times. I, my lungs has collapsed 77 times. And uh, <clears throat> I have results of the soil test, what's in the soil, and the results of what's in their lungs, if you want to see it. But 
somebody needs to be, or someone needs to be accountable for this stuff. It was there when we started. I've got pictures of it on January the 10th when we first started digging. It showed up the next day. It's so fast moving, it shows up overnight. And it'll be two or three inches deep, just like it snowed in the arena overnight. You cut it off with the dozer, it follows right in the dozer tracks coming back. That's how fast it is. It's a very deadly fungus. It's the tenth most dangerous in the world. And <clears throat> the third, there's three of them in our lungs. And the third fungus was discovered in 1926, one case of it. Then again in 2012 it showed up. They don't know how to treat it, and if it's not treated, it's 100% fatal, and it's in that arena. Now, Dr. Shelton, along with the health department in Richmond, has employed an investigator for this. Her testing is almost complete, but I just want it brought up that something definitely got to be done. There's 14 of us that, that cannot work at all, nowhere. But uh, <clears throat> but it's sure appreciated if there's something y'all could do with this. It, take, it attacks your limbs. Uh, Luther Pruitt wanted to be here tonight, but uh, he's in such a bad shape. He's bedridden. He will probably be in the hospital for the day for the night's over. That's his 13th time in intensive care, and it took seven to eight weeks to learn him to walk again. It took his legs. The first time he hit me, it got my left arm and my voice disappeared. And I just fell. They had to carry me out. Bill Vaughn assured me it had been taken care of the second time I went in. I went down again. It had. And to this day, <coughs> we witnessed animals walking out the doors collapsing in that lot up in the sheep show. We got bad coughs, every one of us. Bad stomach problems, groin problems. Huge sores that appear on you, about the size of a nickel. It leaves holes in you. It's first starting in your ears, it goes plumb through your ears. And then inside your mouth, the bottom of your feet didn't work up. And, uh, but, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Mr. Brown had an episode last Monday. He was walking his wife to the convenience store, and he went down. He went out of air. Well, it took about a half hour to get him back up. So he turns around about a block away from his house. He goes down again. It took four hours to get him up. So Luther Pruitt's lungs collapsed on him five or six times, and just out of the blue it does it. If you don't have an inhaler or you're not ready, you're not going to make it. Tanya called me the night that Bobby died <clears throat> and wanted me to take him to see a specialist in Lexington we'd been seeing. So I agreed to it. <clears throat> I said, I'll pick him up in the morning. Well, I stopped to fuel up the next morning to call him and tell him to be there in about 10 minutes. And his son said he died got the coughing and choking and it was it. So that's basically all I got to say about it, but I've got all the information in eight months' time from October the 8th to May the 8th, my medical record is 1,484 pages. It's that deep from this stuff. And it's extremely, extremely dangerous. <laughs> but we sat and we watched the sheep in the sheep show go in one door and out the other and hit the ground. They couldn't get them up. Three of them done it. But I can go near the building now and I'll start throwing it from my lungs. And so will Mr. Brown. So that's basically all I got to say about it. Uh, mm, but it's Mr. Cohn, would you uh, allow Mr. Bear or Ms. Cobb to make a copy of Oh, most definitely. They want a copy of all the medical records. No, well, not, not the medical records. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> okay.
if I could read the medical records, though. You're making a lot more money than I am now. But thank you, Mr. Cody. I've gotten on the final issue three seven five seven. Mr. James Brown. Those are the same same places where he was working. Before I went there, I was boxing. I was jogging a lot. I was very athletic. Within about six months of me working there, I started in the last three months of me working there, I started going into seizures. So they thought it was from boxing. So I had everything, all the exams and examinations done. My brain's fine. I stopped working there. No more seizures. But now I can't breathe. I can't, I can't jog no more. I can't even play with my kids. I just run out of air. Just the other night, like he said, I, I went down and I couldn't get back up. I couldn't breathe. Then about two nights ago, I wake up and still couldn't breathe. Now these, these people, are, they're, they're, it's still there. And they're, they're holding all these events there. And these all these kids that don't have a shot. These kids get it, they're done. That's what my concern is. I don't want no kids getting it. So I, that's why I want you guys to you know, try to look into it because they don't know that they're, they're treating it as uh, the flu, but we're not responding to it. By the time they figure out it's not the flu, it's too late. And they do it to these kids. It's, and a lot of kids go there. They hold a lot of events for the kids. So I'm just saying just look into it because these kids are going to start dropping and no one's going to know why. That's all. Mr. Brown, just, just to clarify, who did you work for? Dean Co. Dean Co. Okay. Who was subcontracted? Yeah. Okay. Just right. want to thank you. All right. Thank you. I want to make sure I was following it correctly. Thank you. We have Miss Tony Remind. My name's Tanya Remines. My husband, Bobby Remines, Robert, um, worked with Dean Tolley at the Expo Center, putting the lights in. Um, Bobby got last October to where he couldn't walk. You know, me being in the healthcare field already, I have a belt, it's called a gate belt. You know, we worked with him. I did till he could get up and walk for Thanksgiving, you know, last year. Um, he got to where his stomach was bothering him and his man parts. Like, he went to the hospital. Nobody could figure out what was going on with him. Um, he just went downhill because of the mold down there. Like, now <coughs> here I am, a year later, October, and my husband's gone. The first time in my life, I'm a single parent of two of my grandkids. Wondering what I'm going to do about a house payment, a car payment, a light bill. You know, listening to Emma scream at night. My heart hurts. I want my papa. I want my daddy <coughs> call. Because that's the only daddy she's known. You know, what do you say to that? She says, I'm going to go climb the walnut tree and I'm going to tell God to give me my papa back. What do you say to a four-year-old? And it's because he worked at that expo center and because of that mold. Like he had fluid around his lungs and around his heart. He couldn't breathe. And I took them to the playground one evening and come home. And he's laying under the bed, gone, with two kids screaming and a holler. Does anybody care? <laughs> I mean, is anybody going to stand up and offer to pay my car payment that I'm weeks behind on because it's $500 a month? Are they going to offer to take and pay my house off? I owe nine months on it. No. Are they going to come in or are they going to buy groceries? Because let me tell you, I went to social services because Bobby's check paid the house payment and bought groceries and things like that because he was on social security disability because he had rheumatoid arthritis. Went to social services over here and filed for food stamps. You wanna know how many I get? 68 bucks a month. Don't get me wrong. 
I'm grateful for what I get. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but $68? Come on. <laughs> you know, my daughter, their mom, out here running around doing whatever, can go right over here, file for food stamps, get 200 bucks. <laughs> Something wrong with this picture. But now Bobby's gone, and here I am, and they're suffering because of the mold. You know? I would much rather have Bobby. Much rather have him. You know, and all I have is just memories. Come on, Miss Emma. I'm sorry for your loss. Yes, but see, that don't do any good if nobody's going to step up and do something about this. Well, because he had rheumatoid arthritis, but let me tell you something. He got out, he would cut wood. You know, he could breathe after he went to work down there. It was over with. Over with. Well, I appreciate each and every one of you all coming and speaking and to us something. because this is, this is the first time that, I mean, I, I heard a few rumors about it, but it does help to hear from you all, and this gives us a chance to, to look at it. I'm just so, saying, it's, it's, so it's you not know, that, yeah. I'd give everything I had, my car, everything, if I could have Bobby. You know? And I know a few of you. A few of you really know me really good. How old did you say you work down there? I got part of A year. He, he took, well, no, it wasn't a year. I'm sorry, I'm lying. He started probably April or May, something like that, and then he quit in September because he got to where he couldn't take and breathe, he couldn't walk, you know, and he was up in doing the lights and the electrical work for Dean Tolley. That's who he worked under was Dean Tolley. So he, that was my name, he worked for Dean Tolley, not Dean Tolley. Right. Okay. And Dean, you know, Bobby hadn't said anything to me, but the day before Bobby passed away, Dean had talked to Bobby and was coming to get him and take him to the doctor. He called the next morning about 9 o'clock, and my son answered the phone, and Bobby, Bobby was gone. Nobody knew anything. You know, we were, he was told that it was it, nothing to worry about. And if you knew Bobby, he would not have took and put himself in a position where it was going to take him away from us. Because I'm going to tell you something. This youngin right here and her brother out here in the chair sitting out here on the phone. You know, our kids was grown. Don't get me wrong. He loves our kids. They mean the world to him. But these two, because he knew that we were all they had, they mean the world to him. He would have walked through hell and high water for them. He would have never put me in a position to where I'd have to let my car go. You know, how am I going to get to work? How am I going to get back and forth to work after they come and get my vehicles? Anybody care? No. <laughs> That's my problem. But no, it's not. It's their problem because all the mold. Come on, sissy. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have time for citizens time. Did anybody come in late? Hearing none, I'll close citizens' time. Next item on the agenda is public hearing for surplus real property. Mr. Barry, we have a, I didn't get a number to read. Uh, it's just what's in the board package. I guess if I them, I'll find it. <laughs> the Wood County Board of Supervisors will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, January the 28th, 2020 at 6.05 p.m. to hear public comment for potential conveyance of lots in Progress Park or on Chapman Road for many of the following tax parcels, 27-61, 27-59, 42-41, and 43-26. Hearing will take place in the boardroom of the County Administration Building, 340 South 6th Street, Whitfield, Virginia, by order of the Board of Super with County Board of Supervisors by Mr. Barrett, County Administrator. 
We did not have anybody sign up to speak for the public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to speak? Mr. Barrett? No, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate we just are, are having a general uh, public hearing to allow for the conveyance of lots um, um, in the future, near or far, uh, for Progress Park or along Chapman Road. So, not hearing any comments, Mr. Chairman, I recommend continuing on. With that being said, I'll close the public hearing. The next agenda item is payment of invoices. I'll entertain a motion to. Voices as presented. Mr. Chairman, I'll make it motion. Have a motion by Mr. McCraw. Second. Have a motion of second. Any invoice any member wants to pull out or discuss. Hearing none, do a roll call vote, Mr. Smith. Aye. 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 Passes 7-0. Next agenda item is minutes of the previous meeting of January the 14th, 2020. Entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Have a motion by Mr. Terry. Second. Have a second by Mr. Smith. Any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, do a roll call vote, Mr. Terry. Aye. Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Approved 7 0. Next agenda item is old business. Does anybody have any old business? Or I know last meeting we left open some appointments um, for various committees. So, Mr. Chairman, I have two uh, uh, individuals I'd like to appoint to the Apex Authority Board. Chair recognizes Mr. Smith. Uh, so the first individual would be Brad Hughes. And the second individual would be Shannon Ball. Take them one at a time. Okay. Uh, have a motion to appoint Mr. Brad Hughes to the Apex Authority. Entertain a second. Second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We're going to do a roll call vote, Mr. Terry. Aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Congratulations, Mr. Hughes. And the next name was Shannon Ball. Have a motion to appoint Mr. Shannon Ball to the Apex Authority. Have a second. Second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Here we're going to do a roll call vote, Mr. Smith. Aye. 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 Motion passes 7 0. Anybody else have any old business? Was that all the, the appointments that you needed on that? What, I, well, I've got one, but how many? There were, we left one vacant. Um, we have received a resignation letter for one that will be effective February 28th or 29th, I believe. Um, and we had another. Uh, resignation this week so there is still one position open uh, to fill the seat of Miss Patterson that will be resigning on February 29th. I've uh, talked to Mr. Jeremy Farley. He's interested in serving. Um, so I'd make a motion that we appoint Mr. Jeremy Farley. Second. Have a motion of a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, do a roll call vote, Mr. Terry. Aye. 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 Motion passes 7 0. Anybody have anything else under old business? Uh, I did have two or three names that uh, would like to serve on that committee. But uh, being a fool, I don't guess we need any. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple more names as well for the future. Um, I would suggest you email Mr. Fair. So you can no way. Unless your memory is better than mine. 
Thank you. Anybody else have anything on their own business? Uh, next item is reports. Our fiscal year 2019 audit report presented by Mr. Corbin Stone. Mr. Stone. Chairman, board members, thanks for having me. You should all have a handout in front of you. I'm going to walk through that for you. Uh, the audit report itself is 145 pages long, so we're not going to go through that. I think everybody has a copy of it in their, their board packet. You did receive what we call an uh, unqualified or unmodified opinion, which means we think the financial statements are materially correct. Um, we did have a couple comments in the back of the report, um, some areas for improvement for the county, but nothing, nothing really earth shattering and um, pretty, pretty common comments in most of the localities we work with. If you flip to page one of that handout, I've got some summary financial information going back uh, from 2010 or two back to 2010. So we've got 10 years worth of data presented here. Uh, on page one, it's a table. We see a bunch of numbers on it. Uh, for governmental funds, you can see you ended the year with a balance of $49.8 million in your general fund and capital projects fund. That's a decrease from last year of a, about $5 million, primarily related to, to school construction. Uh, bond proceeds go into fund balance, and then as they're spent, um, fund balance decreases. You can see the first highlighted yellow line down the page, about a third of the way, is your unrestricted fund balance in your general fund. It ended the year at $39.3 million. Uh, that's, that's an increase from the prior year, uh, right at $4 million. Um, and it's still higher than your, your peak back in 2017 of $36 million. Long-term obligations and fund balance doesn't take this into consideration. Uh, so if you, if you were to try to liquidate all of your long-term debt, uh, long-term debt just below that first green line stood at $52.9 million. So if you took all the, that fund balance together and tried to liquidate all your debt, you'd still owe a little bit at the end of the day. Uh, so the general fund ended the year, general fund, capital projects fund, we call them governmental activities, ended the year with $52.9 million in debt. That includes about $3 million in pension liabilities. So you guys send money up to the Virginia Retirement System every year and they calculate what your liability is to the extent that balance isn't enough to cover the liability, you have a, a, um, a liability we show in your financial reports at the end of the year. If we go down a little bit further, you can see net position for your water and sewer funds. Stood at $31 million. It's between those first two green lines at the end of the year. A slight increase from the prior year. And net position for a water and sewer fund is theoretically, if we were to liquidate and sell off all your water lines and sewer lines, uh, all your systems, pay off all your debt. This is theoretically what you would, you would wind up with at the end of the day. That's un unlikely that you're going to do that. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the net value of that system. Long-term obligations for the enterprise fund end of the year just under $25 million. It's that second green line from the, from the top. And then the next green line shows school board long-term obligations end of the year at $41 million. 40 million of that is pension and post-employment benefit related liabilities. The bulk of it's pension liabilities. Same thing. Uh, they send money to the, to, the, to the state every year. It gets put in a, a statewide pool for teachers. And that liability has been growing over time, uh, primarily because the state really hasn't required the school system to submit enough money or remit enough money to cover those liabilities. Uh, so that's, that's a, a real liability is out there, and ultimately it's going to be funded through higher rates on your retirement plans. Uh, again, the county's pension and OPEB liabilities were three million, the school board's 40 million, so there's a big difference there. Total long-term obligations for the county and the school board stood at $119 million. And if we go down a little bit further, we can see on a per capita basis, that's $4,155. That compares to last year's state average of $5,807. You can see I don't have state data yet for 2019, but it gives you an idea. Your, your total debt per capita is lower than the state average, but that state average is driven a little bit higher by places, Fairfax County, places like that, that tend to carry quite a bit more debt per capita than, than our more rural localities. But you're still below those state averages. The next page, we just graph out fund balance. Mr. Stone, may I just ask one question sure. while, while you're on that page right there? The debt per capita from the earlier years on that report, that is because the, the GASB numbers were not included Yeah, that, yeah ex exactly. Thanks for pointing that out. I'm sorry, I meant to mention that. Um, 
we didn't have to record these pension liabilities up until about 2015. So you can see that your debt per capita way back in 2010 was $1,900. That's because those pension liabilities were not reported in your financial statements. They still existed. There was just no requirement to report them. And so we had a new accounting standard come out about 2014-15 that made us start requiring or, or reporting those liabilities in your financial statements. Thanks for pointing that out, though. And that's also why I don't have state data going back in 2010, 11, 12, because it didn't include those, those pension liabilities. The next page just shows fund balance and debt for the general government. And you can see they're, they're trending pretty, pretty much together. Uh, so there's unrestricted fund balance or unrestricted funds versus your long-term obligations. Uh, you can see they're trending uh, fairly closely together. And just remember that those pension liabilities didn't come in until 2014-15. Uh, now, this is just the general government. It doesn't include that school board pension liability of $40 million. The next page just shows net position for the water and sewer fund. Going back to 2010, just graphing that out. And do remember, we had to start, even for that fund, we started showing a pension liability. It was pretty small because you don't have that many employees in that fund. But about 2014 to 15, we started showing a pension liability there as well. The next page, I, I think the first table gives you a lot of information. And this table uh, on page four uh, tells you what's really driving your, your budgets. Uh, when, we look at, when we look at the county's revenue sources, what we can see at the top, that top green line, your general property taxes. That's going to be real estate, personal property, public service corporations, machinery tools, and merchants capital. That's really your, your primary growing revenue source, if you will. So as you have growth in your expenditures, um, you're covering that with local, locally generated taxes. Other local taxes, that could be meals tax, sales tax, lodging tax, things that are generated locally um, that are generally related to some sort of consumption. Um, you can see that's been fairly flat back from 2006 to 2019, just a slight bit of growth. The next line down, that green line, uh, that shows the Commonwealth's taxes and shared expenses. So essentially, that's their contribution to the county. Um, and you can see that's been flat from 2006 to 2019. The long and short of it, as you have growth in your expenditures, it's going to take local dollars to cover it. We, we can't expect a whole lot of growth in state aid. Um, you can't expect a whole lot of growth in other local taxes just based on the trends. It's going to be those locally assessed taxes against real estate, personal property, and that sort of thing that are going to, are going to have to cover those additional expenses. And the next page, I'm just showing you the tax assessments by fiscal year. <coughs> so this is the actual assessed value of the various uh, assets that are taxed. And the one thing I'll have to point out is real estate, we have to show it at one-tenth of the value because if we showed it at 100%, we would have one line at the top and a bunch of lines grouped together at the bottom. Uh, but you can see real estate, the assessed values really jumped in two, from 2007 to 2008 right there about the, around the time of the financial crisis when real estate values were going up and we've had, we've had a slow climb since then uh, going up just a little bit each year personal property has had pretty good growth since 2005 you can see, see back in 2005 we had 200 million dollars worth of assessed personal property and now you're probably about 255 260 million dollars in in assessed values for personal property uh, the one that's really growing that public service corporation that looks like it's almost going straight up. Those are going to be railroads, uh, power lines, uh, telecommunications companies, and they're assessed by the state. So if you have any major infrastructure improvements there, you're going to see that those assessments grow and that ultimately that tax grow. But this just gives you an idea of what the assessments behind those local taxes are doing. So that's your primary revenue source, and I just want to show you what that, uh, the assessments that are driving those, those revenues. On page six, it's the last graph we have to go over. Um, just shows the school board and their sources of revenue going back to 2006. State aid at the top. You can see that we, we peaked in 2009 with state aid. And really, we, we made up the difference for a year or two with that third line down, which is federal aid. But then since then, the difference has really been made up by, by local dollars. 
so the school board state aid back in 2009 actually uh, was slightly higher than its state aid back in, in 2019. So, and you can see it really dropped off after the Great Recession, and then it's been slowly coming back. The other thing I'll point out is that federal aid spiked up in 2010. Uh, then it started coming back down, and federal aid to the school board is actually lower in 2019 than it was in 2006. Uh, so those federal programs that they, and that's school food, Title I, your special ed programs, um, that they're actually getting less, less federal aid in 2019 than they got in 2006. And I'll, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions about any of those graphs before I... The next, the next couple of pages, page seven and eight, are just our management comments from the audit. Uh, just some areas for improvement uh, for the county to look at over the next year. And then pages nine through 20 is something called our letter to those charged with governance. If we came in to do an audit and staff wasn't responsive, if they didn't provide us with documents, um, to support the financial statements. We'd tell you about it right here. Uh, we didn't have any problems. So you got the boilerplate letter. It, this letter does also point out some of the significant estimates in the financial statements. So that pension liability, that's an estimate from the state. Um, they don't, those are based on actuarial tables. So when somebody retires, they assume this is how long they're gonna live and how long a pension is gonna be due to them. So those are estimates based on actuarial tables, rates of return that they expect to get on their investments and that sort of thing. And then finally on, on page 21 through the remainder of the remainder of the handout, page 27, if, if you're having trouble sleeping tonight, these are new accounting standards that are coming out uh, in the next several years. Uh, so I wanna point those out to you. Um, <laughs> they're, they're not riveting, I'll tell you that. Um, the, the one that is going to impact the county more than the others, uh, right now, if you guys go out and lease, lease something to own it, that's called a capital lease, and we record it as a liability in your financial statements and record it as an asset in your financial statements. This new standard says if you're leasing anything, copiers, um, anything that that has to be reported in the financial statements going <coughs> forward, even if it's not a lease to own type arrangement. Um, so it's going to require staff to go out and figure out what leases you have at the county, school board, social services, uh, and get a good list of all those leases together, and then some tables showing payments over time. Uh, that's going to be the one that impacts the county the most, not from a number standpoint, just from an effort standpoint, that your staff's going to have to go out and do a little bit more work. Um, but again, it's 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 not riveting, uh, so I won't I won't bore you with it any longer. Again, the audit went well. We were very pleased with the county. Um, I can we don't have any problems with with the county. When we show up and ask for stuff, they get it to us. Uh, so we we really don't have any issues. Uh, didn't have any issues conducting the audit. And you received an unqualified or unmodified opinion. That means the treasurer's reconciling the bank statements. Uh, that means that the tax delinquent tax list agrees with what it should be, that sort of thing. So um, really pleased with what we saw. So, I'll, I'll stop there and answer any questions that you have. Any questions? No, sorry, not Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, if you do have any questions about the audit or your finances in general, don't hesitate to give me a call. My contact information is right there on the front. I'm happy to help you guys. And, and, and don't worry about getting the bill the next day. So I'm here to help you guys. All right. Ring down and say that. I'm going to have to sing happy birthday, too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Just as a reminder to the public, this is a public document. If anybody wants a copy, it's available here at the county building. It's also online. It's part of our board package. Um, next on the agenda is Mr. Chairman, if I might, would you all make a motion to accept the audit following this presentation? I'll make that motion. Second. I have a motion of a second to accept the fiscal year 2019 audit. Any discussion? 
continue on with the baffling of numbers tonight after following Corbin and the audit. Um, as included in your um, board packet, you received a copy of the uh, treasurer's report. And with the month end of December, our um, consolidated account had a balance of $68,402,788 and included in that balance the general fund balance <coughs> Forty-six million four hundred sixteen thousand and forty-six dollars. Um, December uh, did not include all of our tax collections because we were still processing mail payments up into about mid-January. So the December ending does not cover all of our tax collections. So you'll see when you uh, receive the January statement next month that um, it's going to a little bit more accurately reflect what our revenues were up through. Um, technically the December 5th due date. Uh, it took us till about, um, well, like I said, close to mid-January before we were able to get caught up on the, the mail and get all of our payments entered in. Um, does anyone have any questions on the financial statement before I continue on? I'm getting ready to go to that. <laughs> I just, well, I just didn't want you to disappoint me tonight. So I don't have Mr. Hale here to ask a question, so I'm relying on you solely now. Um, <laughs> and his face turned red. <laughs> um, I did a calculation on our taxes up through uh, end of business yesterday uh, just because of um, kind of continuing on through the month, which... Uh, on going back to the treasurer's report on the last uh, two three pages last three three pages um, gives a breakdown of each tax year and what our balance was at the beginning of the month and then the ending balance which is what is yet to be collected but um, keep in mind those amounts um, that you see on the beginning pages uh, starting with well the second to page one that you have in the report for the statement of revenues. Um, those are budget items, which we don't um, budget for the entire amount that we're gonna be billing out. So when you see, for example, on that page, the 93% uh, collection for real estate, that's only gonna be 93% of what's budgeted. That's not 93% of what we've billed out, okay? So you kind of have a difference there. Um, but currently, uh, with tax collection for the 2019 year, and we built out in um, October, yes, in early October was when the bills went out. The real estate rate is currently at 91.4%. Um, 90, and then personal property um, is sort of all over the place. The personal property is still pretty low at this point. Mobile home is low, but Merchants Capital, Machine and Tool, Public Service Corp, all of those, the collection rates are higher simply because those are business-related taxes and the businesses are going to um, be a little bit more apt to go ahead and pay before the due date than sometimes we are as individuals. But um, overall collection rate between real estate and personal property is averaging out to 91.6%. Um, and of course, the next couple of months we'll collect quite a bit just simply because a lot of folks are getting their income tax <coughs> refunds and they use those to pay their taxes with. So um, then in relation to license fees, with what was billed out, uh, in addition to supplements, we're at about 67% collection on those. So that's, that's kind of low, but you have a lot of um, license fees that are still connected to those unpaid personal property bills. So that'll be coming in as well. Um, for the most part over the next couple months. But um, all in all, that's where we are with tax collection for 2019. And again, that's up through end of business yesterday were the numbers that I pulled today to, um, to put this together for you. So any questions on anything? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clayton. Commissioner of Revenue, Ms. Kathy Ball. 
Um, I feel that we've had a, a smooth transition. Um, since I got elected, I went to new officer training in Richmond for three days. I've also been to COIN training, which is um, what the comp board uses to reimburse the county for um, salaries and for uh, expenses in the office. Um, I've created a website, um, Kathy Vault, Commissioner of the Revenue. Um, I want to post things that are going on in the office. I've had three posts. I posted a job. I'm taking applications through the end of the month, and I hope to have somebody in place by the middle of February. I also did a post that uh, we will start doing state income tax returns on February the 1st, and we will also start taking our age disability credit applications on February the 1st, and that will go through May the 1st. That's a program that benefits a lot of people in the county. Um, it's an income-based program. Um, income ha annual income has to be house, excuse me. Annual household income has to be less than thirty thousand um, dollars. We have mailed out our business personal property returns. Uh, we mailed those out a little early, and we're already getting them back. Um, I've mailed out um, mobile home rendition of, to the mobile home parks. Um, the owners will tell me who's in lot one, who, uh, their address, the size of the mobile home, and the type. Um, I've mailed out to the campgrounds. There's three. Um, KOA, the one on the interstate, Pioneer Village, and um, the one in Fort Chisel. Um, we're starting to work our building permits. We pick everything, all the building permits up um, at the first of the year. 25% uh, is foundation and framing, 50% is if it's under roof, 75% is if there's anything on the inside, sheetrock, and 100% is uh, fit for use or occupancy. Does anybody have any questions? So we've been pretty busy. Sounds good. What was, what was the website again? Um, it's Kathy Law, Commissioner of the Revenue. Yes, Yes. Oh, okay, gotcha. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll also mention she has reviewed. We've got a draft contract out. Uh, later this year, a reassessment firm will need to start working <coughs> with the county and do reassessment in calendar year 2021 to go into effect for uh, calendar year 2022. Uh, so, uh, been previously um, procured through Mount Rogers Planning District Commission. Uh, interviews have previously been conducted, uh, and we've uh, we've got a draft contract out and going through the uh, contractor for review, uh, and then probably would anticipate them starting to do some of their initial background work later this summer to fall. And that's state motivated. We've got to do it every five, five years. years. Five. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Sheriff Pete Duggan. I don't uh, know if everybody here knows, but <coughs> I recently promoted our IT person to my administrative assistant, which has created a a need for an IT person and we really need one because we have a lot of technology in our office we've got the digit ticket where they're doing the electronic ticketing we've got body cameras on all officers some cars still have cameras that stuff considered <coughs> evidence and we need an IT person to coordinate with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office and get the stuff that they need and uh, I sent Stephen a memo he said it's part of your board package if you hadn't been able to read it, uh, I brought a few extra. But if you've already read that, I'd like to discuss uh, filling that position with. It's pretty, the the, the uh, memo to Stephen pretty much just tells you what my thoughts on it are. So we'll keep going. Okay. We, we have found somebody who has a skill set to uh, 
do what we need done at the office. Stephen knows her. Uh, I didn't realize I knew her, I knew her until I met her because it's uh, Marty Stallard's ex-wife. Uh, she worked with Stephen, put herself through IT training at the community college. When she graduated, the community college hi hired her, and she has been up there for the last 15 years until the, the uh, community college started making their cuts. And she, as I said, she has the skill set that we need at our office. She could do a, about everything already. Uh, Todd, your new IT guy, he speaks very highly of her. Uh, but she won't come for a salary of less than 47, uh, 45,000. Uh, I looked that up. That's uh, not an exorbitant amount to, to ask for somebody with 15 years experience. But I can't continue to pay for her. I'm asking you guys to pay for her. Stephen will tell you uh, last year the governor introduced, had some inter some legislation introduced that, that basically does not make people pay their fines. So police activity fund is slowly going down. Sometimes the bigger hits, uh, but we're in a slow period right now. But I don't think if they leave that legislation in that the police activity is going to be handled much of anything. So I'm requesting that uh, y'all pay for an IT person for us because you pay for all the other IT people. I don't know why we should have to pay for our own. And I think that's totally the budget, budget committee has a recommendation uh, regarding that matter. Yes, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Anybody got any questions? Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Sheriff Donning. Next item on the agenda is Water Committee Report. Oh, Building and Grounds Committee Report. <coughs> the Building and Grounds Committee met. And if you look in your package, you'll see a letter from <coughs> Mr. Art Davis who, sub or who leases the uh, Progress Park. Uh, he's getting out of farming and he wants uh, wanted permission to sublease Progress Park property to the bottom of the uh, Evergreens. Um, the committee approved it. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would like to state uh, Mr. Davis has leased the property uh, since I believe 1999 out of the park. Uh, this is the final year of the lease. Uh, the lease expires December 31st, 2020. Uh, so this would just be for the remainder of this year. And I will note, this is on the uh, grazing lease only. There is a separate hay lease on lot 24, and this does not include the lot 24 lease on hay. This just includes the grazing lease, which is on the majority of the park. So Art's going to keep the lease on lot 24? <coughs> the hay lease he is going to be keeping right now, yes. And there was some discussion in the committee about Mr. Lee, Mr. Davis's lease on the hay actually goes out one more year, but he could end it annually. And I have discussed with him, and he will probably go ahead and send us a letter to end that lease as of December 31st this year. And that way we can look at bidding all of that out together for next year. Coming from a committee doesn't need a second any more discussion. Mr. Uh, take a roll call vote authorizing uh, Mr. Davis to sublease the uh, progress park property to bottom Mr. Terry. Aye. Uh, yeah. Aye. 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 Group 7 0. <clears throat> the Building Grounds Committee also had a uh, discussion about the uh, Apex Center and the change order was put in. Uh, if you remember last time we had a change order for the $4,000, we asked them to go back and look at that. Um, they're going to take some concrete board, concrete fiber board out from around the side of it. 
uh, which caused a reduce of uh, $7,500 back to us. And they take 4000 out for the rock removal, which gives us a refund of $3,500 uh, for the Apex Barn project. Have anything to add, Mr. No, sir, Mr. Chairman. Coming from the meeting, does need a second? Do a roll call vote, Mr. Smith? Aye. 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 Through 7 and 0. Anything else from the Buildings and the Grounds Committee? No, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> water Committee report. Uh, the Water Committee met on January 21st, 2020, and recommends increasing the water rates effective March 1st, 2020 as follows uh, currently our residential and commercial rates are the same at eighteen dollars and ninety cents for zero to a thousand gallons and then nine dollars and forty five cents per thousand gallons after that uh, and our proposed rate will still be the same for residential and commercial it will be twenty dollars and seventy nine cents for zero to a thousand gallons and ten dollars and forty cents for every thousand gallons afterwards. And that's the committee's recommendation. Mr. Barrett, any comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, what, what the committee has recommended um, in, in looking at it, and I did share information with the board and, and spreadsheet. Um, basically, as we previously reported, uh, the water committee, which is an enterprise zone account, uh, which means that its revenues are to be covering its expenses and we, we try to cover that without having to rely on general fund dollars to help assist that. Um, this takes uh, a first step in helping to cover some of those losses or as, as I reported to sort of slow down or stop the bleeding uh, from our um, water uh, fund balance at this point in time. Um, the uh, rates were last increased in 2015, so they've been solid for almost five years. I think it was June or July that they went into effect previously in 15. Uh, so the committee um, does recommend the increase. Uh, this is a dollar and 89 cent a month increase uh, on the base rate, um, and it is a 95 cent increase on the uh, per thousand gallons afterwards. Any discussion? So Mr. Meyer, um, I know we talked about this last week, or the last board meeting, um, but there's more to it than just the water department being in, operating in the red. There's, there's other reasons why we need to raise these rates, correct? Well, there, there, there's a couple of reasons. One is to, to, to start getting it up there. We've got, um, We've got additional expenses coming on. We do have the New River Regional Water Authority that has not had a freight increase uh, since its existence, which is probably in a situation where they are going to be looking at a rate increase coming up. Um, we have water projects uh, that citizens would like to have water, that some board members would like to, to have water extended to, and we've got to get ourselves into a, a viable situation. Uh, Mr. Grant talked with the committee. Uh, Mr. Grant has lots of previous experience working um, with regional water authorities and, and companies before he came to the county. And in fact, he, he teaches a, with others a short course every year on water works, financial viability. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a first step. I understand there are some concerns from others of how do you revamp things and, and Mr. Uh, Grant is willing to work with, uh, with the committee and, and with the board members and study that as to how maybe we, we, we um, revise <coughs> rates or terminology or things in the future for what we need, but we certainly uh, need to at least start addressing the shortfall in it at this time. Yeah, so the, the people that's needing water, to raise these rates, that's to help us get to where we need to be so we can get grant money yes, sir. versus taking out of the general fund. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, I, you know, I understand the, the, the need behind raising the rates, but I think in our previous meeting, we potentially discussed some additional avenues and some additional options, and we may or may not have got those, but 
I don't know that putting a Band-Aid on the issue is the actual answer to it for the citizens. You know, if it's a problem and it's obviously bleeding money, we've got to figure out how to stop the bleeding. Putting a Band-Aid on is not the long-term solution. I think we look at other options and other avenues and find a rate structure that's going to solve the issue, not a rate structure that's going to put a Band-Aid on. And I, I agree with the Band-Aid, you know, but we got to get more customers too. To make a problem, yeah. we got to have customers. Yeah, and I'll so agree. So we have with people that. in the county that's needing water. So we, we definitely need to do what we can to get them water. Yeah, I've argued the same point since I've been on this board, and I got Ricky Road over there, ten years, getting water down there to about thirty people. Now that's ridiculous. I have people in my area that needs water, wants water. We got people out here in the lower end of Whitfield that wants water. What are we going to do? Yeah. Except you and tell them no. When a woman comes up here and tells you that she's got small kids that has to take a bath in water that stinks, she can't drink it, she buys water. It's, it's time. We need to do something about it. I'll agree wholeheartedly, Mr. McRoberts. I, that's why I think we need to look at the whole plan and figure out the true solution to it. We're on the same page. People need water. I'm 100% with you. I pay, a, I pay a, a user fee every month. And I'll tell you one thing, I'm glad to pay it. Because I know that water's there if I need it. That's all right. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Fair, when we visited this, uh, I believe, probably about a year ago, do you recall just off the top of your head what we were proposing? It was much higher than this, if I remember right. I'm thinking it was 10%. Mr. Chris was here. Do you remember the amount, Mr. Chris? I thought it might be 10%. Uh, 10% was the most yeah. I recall. Yeah, around. You know, this this really and truly doesn't affect my area, you know, it, uh, it does affect part of my area, but the majority of my area is in town and has town water, but, and no one wants to raise any rates. I certainly don't ever want to raise rates, but, you know, it's been five years. I believe this is a reasonable rate, and it you know it does break my heart to see so many people in the county that want water and we can't do anything for them because we're not you know no one's really taking the initiative to bump it up a little bit each year and i understand you mr terry it, it we do need to look at the whole picture but also if we don't start somewhere i'm afraid we're never going to so it's it's definitely a tough decision to make and that's all thank you Anybody else? Um, you know, since I've been on this board, my, my sticking point has been the, the non-user fee has been the same as the base rate. That's why at the last meeting I was to see several options. And the only option that was brought back was the same option we discussed at that meeting. You know, I, I requested that we reduce the non-user fee down to uh, something like $15 a month because people will save that much on their homeowners insurance by having a fire hydrant on the road. Uh, that's what I would request to uh, be passed. I understand we need to raise the rates, make it self-sufficient. I understand there's people who want water. I just have a hard time charging people that don't want the water the same minimum that people pay that do want the water. Uh, gonna pay it anyway. They're gonna pay it out of your tax money, that's general fund money. They're gonna pay it. Uh, I just, you know, we've been, this board has been very supportive of what's going on in Richmond. 
with the Second Amendment, and I don't think this is any different. I don't like the government telling somebody they can't use something they've used for years. They do, they have to pay. Mr. Chairman, I may be mistaken, but I think we discussed that option, and if we drop the user rate, instead of going to $20, we would probably have to go to $23 or maybe even $25 for that minimum uh, to cover the difference in the money. And, Mr. Chairman, and, I, and, that, and that's exactly the information that I requested to see. And, and, and me personally, whether it's a chair or any board member, when you make a request, I think we should do it from county staff. Well, and and that way, so we can, I'm, excuse me. That way, when we go and explain this to the citizens, we can show it to them. You know, I, I got one piece of information. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mr. Jim, what I was going to say, and that's what I was trying to allude to when I was talking about Mr. Grant and looking at the structure and everything was along the lines of, of what you're asking for. To get us up to meeting the grant eligibility standards and everything right now would take almost a 30% increase in our water rates to just get it to where we need to be. And no one can accept that. That's not, that's not feasible. That's not where we need to go. What you're asking for is what Mr. Grant and I think the Water Committee will continue to look at. We want to go ahead and look at getting the rate increase in place to start helping us. But long term, exactly what you're asking for, how do you structure the rate structure? Is there a way to lower that non-user fee? Is there a way to make it a separate fee? Do you call it an availability fee or a, a fire fee or whatever in the process and determine what that rate is? But it will take time and structure to do that. There's also discussion about commercial rates being on a different level than the residential rates. And, and all of those items we factored in uh, it's just time is of the essence to at least initially start addressing it, but then to add those factors in. So they are not been overlooked. They are they will be looked at in the entire uh, flow of what's happening. So in the in that flow, what's the timing on looking at that? Well, obviously we would be starting on it as soon as possible uh, as we as we go into the budget cycle. We know the budget numbers of what we're looking at, and then going into uh, that. So. Um, you know, with, with the budget coming up, Mr. Grant, I would say, you know, allow us six months to, to get everything in place for that and look at recommendations of where we go. And then that way you can have something for, you know, later this year, maybe start the first of next year on different rate structure. All right. So if we do this temporary increase or make this increase, we are going to look at actually trying to fix the problem instead of mandate it, correct? Am I understanding before I cast my vote? Well, y yes, and, and, and this is not an attempt to band-aid it. This is, this is an attempt to start bringing the rates up, but okay. we can't do full surgery of what it would take because we sure. don't think that would be feasible for you all to adopt or feasible on the census. Okay. So, um, um, but we are looking at different ways of trying to cure the problem. So yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Baer. <coughs> Mr. Chair. Yes, when the committee looked at that, we looked at all the different things that were possible, like you asked for, okay? But any changes that we made, we had to have another public hearing and postpone it. And the prior board has postponed and postponed and postponed, and it's time to do something. And so... I don't think if, if we lowered the rates, the only, the only reason we would have to have another public hearing is if it was raised higher than what the public so we could reduce the non-user fee and not have a, for example. You could, yes. So is there an option tonight to leave the non-user fee as it is and then and raise the, the rate? I mean, I know that's not what the chairman was it's, looking for, but. Um, <clears throat> everything is feasible. I will say it's, it's easier said than done because the entire rate structure and the rate billing structure and everything is set up on the first thousand gallons of the non-user being the same. So uh, it, it could happen. It, it means right now instead of making up, you know, we could run the numbers and calculate. Obviously by not increasing that non-user fee, it decreases the amount of revenue that is coming in and decreases what our projection is to help offset some of the negative numbers that we are at right now. All right. But, 
So, so I do think we need to have that as a separate line item versus being in the as a non-user. I think it needs to be whatever we want to call it, but it, so it doesn't impact these rates. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bear, refresh my memory. What is the non-user right now? Is it the eighteen? The, the, the $20, $18.90 is okay. the, the non-user rate, and it would go to $20.79. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. That is the, that is the same rate as the, the uses okay. up to 1,000 gallons. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Budget Committee met on January 23rd and recommends the, f the following recommendations. Uh, transfer surplus 2013 for Taurus to the Technology Center for training purposes in the criminal justice classes. Mr. Baird, would you like to explain? Yeah, the um, sheriff contacted me last week. He indicated that they um, had a... Um, surplus vehicle and that the uh, technology center um, had a use for that vehicle. I want to say it has close to 200,000 miles on it, uh, but they could use it in training with their class. Uh, recommendation from the committee would be to uh, declare the vehicle surplus and transfer it to the school board. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, I need to abstain from this because the school and my wife Well, you, you have enough to do. Okay. <laughs> I was just hoping it was your, I'm, just hoping, I'm just hoping it's your old car and they're going to make you start walking. <laughs> the kids will love it. Yeah. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote, Mr. Smith. Aye. Uh, abstain. 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 Aye. Uh, Aye. I'm sorry, Jay. All right. I almost got the vote by myself. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, the Budget Committee makes the following recommendation, approving the fund, uh, the Sheriff's Office IT person 100% from the general fund. Mr. Baird? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Smith? Yes, sir. Uh, on our recommendation memo, <coughs> excuse me, it says approve to fund the Sheriff's Office IT position, but in the memo from Sheriff Dunnigan, uh, he states that he's willing to share an IT person with the Commonwealth Attorney Office. Do we need to amend that recommendation? Well, I, that was going to be a part of my, one of the questions I had tonight. Basically, you are, you are, he's requesting, currently the position has been funded out of the PAF uh, for the first half of this year. Uh, he is requesting that that be changed over to coming out of um, the general fund. Um, but um, the, the question would be, um, is this going to be a sheriff's po office position or is this going to be a county IT position and then assign that person to work with the sheriff's office and the constitutional officers because I would like to see this individual also do work with dispatch because with the Spillman system and everything else that's tying together between the town, the county, and, and dispatch center, it's all combined. So it's somewhat cleaner to just transfer it to being a county hired position and assign them to work with the dispatch um, 
IT for the sheriffs and uh, the uh, commission, uh, Commonwealth's Attorney's Office. The way, <clears throat> the way the memo is written here it talks about us funding the IT position um, 100%, but is there two issues here of funding it and also raising the salary on it? There is an issue on, uh, I don't know enough on the salary. I don't know what he has left over in his account that applies towards the salary, and I do not remember offhand uh, what the previous person's salary is at to know what we need to do. But we could come back to the budget committee and make a budget recommendation to amend. We could bring someone in on what we've got, and we could amend the budget to bring it up to what it needs to be. I think the general question is, is there a agreement with funding at 100% out of the general fund, which is a recommendation from the, the committee? Uh, this position, historically, when it was first created, it was 50% county, 50% general fund, and then, I don't know, Mr. Foster may know, it may have been what, five, six years ago, it went to 100% um, PAF funded at that time. Um, I had discussions with the sheriff about splitting it again and, and he would like it to be and obviously we all know that IT is continually growing amongst all departments and IT is critical for all of us and there uh, we've had discussions about needing for increase in IT in, in the sheriffs in, in the county as a whole so if it's the difficulty is if, if it's a sheriff's department employee then it's difficult is it a, is it, are they working for the Commonwealth Attorney also? Are they not working for the Commonwealth Attorney? It's actually cleaner if it's a county employee and you assign them to work in all those departments in the process. Uh, Mr. Bear, my only concern with that is if the Sheriff's Office has had, had a full-time IT person for however many years, and, and I realize this is what he says in his, in his letter, that it can be, you know, the person can be shared. But when we start talking about sharing with dispatch and sharing with other departments, is that person going to be spread so thin and the sheriff's office not, you know, have the IT for all of the... I, the goal would be, no, the goal would be to, to assign them to work with those three departments okay. in that. Okay. I don't think they've got an office down there. Yeah. Uh, the only concern I would have on the... Who the employees assigned to is dealing with the sheriff's office and the Commonwealth Attorney. The amount of evidence they would be exposed to, and then followed under the sheriff's office policy. Because I think it's too much to ask a county employee to follow county policy and sheriff's office policy, or if it was other sheriff's office, the evidentiary procedures and Mr. Farthing may chime in would be along the same yeah. that, that and it's I mean the person this the person that did this job previously was under the sheriff under the PAF but they did help out you know as needed in other areas. So it, it can continue in that manner. Anybody else else have any questions or discussion? No, I mean I don't think the sheriff will have an issue with it because it's you know he called it out in his request. Here, then we'll do a roll call vote, Mr. Smith. Aye. Aye. Abstain. Abstain. Aye. 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 Motion passes five, four, two. Two abstains. Two abstains. I need a, like a baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Swift, baby. Anything else from the budget committee? No, Mr. Chairman. Under new business, uh, the consent calendar. Make a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. Have a motion to approve the consent calendar. Have a second. Second. Have a motion and a second. We need a roll call vote. Yes, sir. Roll call vote, Mr. Terry. Aye. 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 Approve 7 0. With County Community Health Assessment, Dr. Is that correct? 
Dr. Karen Chuck. Yeah. It didn't have Dr. Mrs. Oh. about it more in so <laughs> <laughs> for you. Um, thank you all. We wanted to uh, let you know about the community health assessment that we did this past year with many of the community partners. Some of them are here tonight. If you helped with our community health assessment, please stand up and um, thank you. so everybody can kind of know who helped to work on all this. So thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, but we worked with many different community partners for this, including the With County Hospital, With Land Foundation, uh, With County Community College, uh, Department of Social Services, the Mount Rogers Community Services, uh, One Care, Brock Hughes, the Town of Whitful, uh, Whitful Police Department, um, Whitful Chamber, Parks and Rec, and also Ballot Health. So uh, if I missed anyone, I apologize, but we had a lot of great community involvement with this. Plus, we did send out the... Um, surveys and hopefully some of you took those surveys that about the community health assessment so this was an assessment where we look at um, what are the needs that have been identified in the community and things that we as community partners address together as you know the needs of the community are too great really for any one agency to address them but when we identify several needs that the community agrees on and then we work together as multiple agencies within the community we hope to come up with better solutions in your packet you'll have a synopsis of the community health assessment uh, the the uh, priorities that were found as well as some of the implementation plan we discussed so we'll go through this as far as are you helping forward me along there thank you so uh, as far as the process and you all can be able to see it up here but when we started the community health assessment process we met with um, our community partners and did the uh, surveys as well and this was the analysis that came out of the surveys that people did online or on paper and that were assessed and you can see that uh, many of the priority areas involve substance use, um, alcohol use, access to health care, obesity, other health care needs, unemployment. Um, when we looked at the priority areas, there were five that were uh, targeted in general, those being substance use, unemployment, transportation, obesity, and health care access. Uh, with the community partners, after we assessed these, we kind of looked at them individually as far as what we could actually do as community partners uh, to have implementation of strategies to address these problems. When you do an imp implementation plan, you look at th three to five years down the road, what you can work on together and how this process will look. Along the way, we do evaluation. We see what's working, what might need to be improved, whether other strategies need to be looked at, and then we do the process again. So this is an ongoing process that we're doing in all of our communities. For the problem of substance abuse, we talked specifically about um, engaging with our community education about substance use in Wythe County, and we're going to start that process a little bit tonight. We also talked about uh, the possibility of establishing a recovery court in Wythe County, a drug court. Uh, Mount Roger Community Services has plans to exp ex um, expand their medication assisted treatment in Wythe County. Uh, we also talked about education for our health care providers about better prescribing. Uh, we talked about developing programs for students on education for substance use and uh, having more wraparound comprehensive um, services in, with our agencies. We looked also at transportation and possible options. And again, these are things that we look at and we you know, come together and see what will work. But we talked about uh, transportation assistant pro assistance program for those with substance use needs, uh, expanding awareness that Mountain Cap has an emergency transportation pro program specifically for medical needs and in with, in with County, um, looking at expanded hours for transportation and uh, looking specifically at something with the community college, making sure that students can get there to their classes. Um, what about Uber? or Lyft or other options for the county and a ballot health was looking at a transportation program across the Holston Medical uh, Methodist Church uh, Conference because they uh, do encompass the 21 county ballot footprint and how would th that look to help our communities um, when we look at um, obesity we talked about expanding programs such as fit for life and shape up Sheffy to other areas of the county and also looked at using our school facilities as community action centers where people could actually use school facilities that were present or maybe if you had other open buildings that the community could partner with developing more activity programs when we looked at employment uh, we talked about things like continuing workforce development through the Wythe County uh, Community College and also um, looking at the impact of substance use on job prospects as it affects the county. We talked about expanded child care capacity and this was identified as a real need within the county as far as apparently a couple of key child care centers uh, closed down and so how do we accommodate our working families in providing uh, quality child care for them. <laughs> Um, also looked at um, economic development and incentive packages for industry in the area and working with the administration and the board on that. We looked at health care access and having continued efforts for a, a, um, 
an urgent care center with expanded hours and also expanded services. Uh, Brock Hughes has opened up uh, increasing clinic services as well as taking Medicaid in their clinic now. Uh, the Land Ministry Center has expanded a dentistry program that is I guess combined with the Brock Hughes Center as far as providing dental care for the citizens of the community we're very excited about. Medicaid enrollment has a positive impact as far as being able to give more of our citizens insurance and ability to hopefully do more preventative care than in end in, in care. And then um, looking at how do we educate people about their Medicaid and how to better utilize these services. Um, Mount Rogers Community Services is looking at opening a crisis care center at some point this year, and we're excited about that opportunity. They have just opened up a crisis count, uh, center in Smith County that is working very well. So with that role, that model already in place, the one for Wick County is coming. Coming this summer. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> and so um, also expanding community awareness of the resources that we do have in our community. 211 is an excellent resource and there might be other things there. And then looking at uh, continued recruitment of health care providers in the region. I know that Mr. Wilkins at the hospital has been looking at what are the possibilities and how does the hospital need to expand there. So looking at all these things in general, um, we did want to start our first uh, our first. Uh, thing on the list was continued education about substance use in the county. We have in your packet a, just a little brief about substance use in Wythe County. Uh, it mirrors closely substance use in the rest of the Mount Rogers Health District that we serve as well as regionally. But when we look at overdose deaths, there have been 62 overdose deaths in the last 12 years in Wythe County. Um, our primary drugs of choice in the area are prescription opioids as well as methamphetamine. Opioids nas nationally and across the state have become a very deadly drug um, because opioids work very um, much to um, suppress the breathing so people will die from actually not breathing. Opioids are also very highly addictive. Of the f over 1,400 deaths that occurred last year in the state of Virginia, over 1,200 of them were from an opioid overdose death. Uh, you can see that across the state, the state is the whole state is affected by uh, opioid overdose deaths. As we look specifically at uh, opioids, uh, prescription opioids, you will notice that there has not been a great increase in the number of prescription opioid deaths across our state over the last 10 years. It's about 500 prescription opioid deaths per year. But Southwest Gen uh, Virginia does have the highest concentration of prescription opioid deaths. In some of the other portions of the state to the north and the east, you'll find more heroin and fentanyl deaths. But we are having an increase of heroin and fentanyl deaths even locally in Wythe County. Methamphetamine, as you know, is a drug of choice for our, South, our communities here. In the past, methamphetamine has not been what we would associate as a drug of death because it's a stimulant. So if people died, it was more from something like a heart attack or something of that nature. Um, up until just the last few years, there were only 10 or less methamphetamine deaths per year across the whole state. This last year, there were over 120 deaths from methamphetamine. And this is because um, when people have started buying these products off the street, instead of making them in their backyard, although that was horrible as it was, but when you buy them off the street, the methamphetamine, you don't always know what you get. Uh, fentanyl is being cut into the products, so that's an opioid. And so people are actually dying an opioid type death from their use of methamphetamine and the mixing of these drugs. You can see that across the state of Virginia, um, methamphetamine falls Interstate 81 corridor pretty well. And Wythe County is counted amongst those of the highest rates of methamphetamine deaths. We look also at some of the other harms besides deaths that are associated with, uh, with drug use. Hepatitis C is nationally used as a marker for uh, substance use. Um, across the, um, across uh, Wythe County, um, we do have higher than state rates for hepatitis C, approximately double. Um, and there are approximately 50 ca new cases of chronic hepatitis C diagnosed every year in Witt County at a cost of approximately $100,000 to $300,000 per treatment. If you treated all 50 cases in Witt County, it would be between five and $10 million per year just in hepatitis C treatment. The, um, CDC did a study nationally to look at what were the counties at greatest impact of an HIV and a hepatitis C epidemic, and Wythe County was named among the top eight, uh, top five percent of counties across the nation. Back in this other graph, you'll see that there were eight counties in Virginia that were on this list, and Wythe County is among them. I will tell you that we did have an increased cluster of hepatitis C cases in 2018 in Wythe County. We were able to do some county education and to provide some services in these communities. 
uh, you know, we'll be looking to see if these rates go down, but there are other ways we want to be able to address these harms as well. We, we additionally look at other harms. Hepatitis A is uh, something that in the past was just associated with foreign travel, but in about 2016, there began a hepatitis A ep epidemic across our country that was first started in the homeless population and has rapidly spread to our homeless population, those who are incarcerated or, or previously incarcerated, and those who are substance using. The Mount Rogers Health District has the undistinct pleasure of being the having the highest number of hepatitis A cases in our state and the majority of them related to substance use or previous incarceration. We do have some in our community though who have had hepatitis A who have none of these high risk factors. Um, the predominant cases that we have seen of this have been in Bristol and Washington County and Smith County, but it is pulling up into Wythe County and Grayson County and around the rest of our district. So hepatitis A is different than hepatitis C. I should have backed up with that. Hepatitis B and C are what we call bloodborne pathogens and ones that are more uh, readily associated with drug use such as needle sharing and that sort of thing. Hepatitis A is also a viral infection of the liver, but this one is a foodborne pathogen illness. So this is one that is by eating contaminated food or water, and that's why it's traditionally been associated with travel to foreign countries, but now we do have it uh, beginning to be endemic in our country as well. Uh, other harms that are associated with substance use include neonatal, neonatal abstinence syndrome. This is when babies who, uh, mothers have used substances while they were pregnant. Uh, when the babies are born and they go through a withdrawal from the substance, uh, those substances they exhibit a withdrawal syndrome that's called neonatal abstinence syndrome. Wythe County has higher state than state rates, uh, at least double and some, and some years triple for neonatal abstinence, abstinence syndrome. As we look across the state, you can see that Southwest Virginia does, again, have predominantly higher than state rates for NAS. So we look at what can we do to begin addressing these problems. We look by beginning to address something called adverse childhood experience or ACEs. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this term. We begin to talk about resiliency in our community and the, and the trauma-informed care or trauma-informed communities are terms which we are looking at regionally and even statewide. Adverse childhood experience have to stem with the fact, and there is something in your brochure that looks at these things. Uh, this was a flyer developed by a pediatrician at East Tennessee State, but it talks about abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction, and how um, p uh, children who are exposed to these things during their, their developmental years will develop lifelong difficulties with many things uh, as far as their reaction uh, to how um, how they cope with life skills, and it can affect things that you would expect, like they have higher uh, rates of alcohol use or drug use. But additionally, uh, we find that even people will have basic increase in their health problems, such as cancer, diabetes, uh, or obesity. So we look at how people can overcome adverse childhood experiences, and we talk about resiliency, and we talk about fostering uh, a community that will help to uh, mentor and guide people in coping with the with these problems and coping with, and learning life skills and how they can overcome them. On the back of the sheet, it talks about some of these things. This is something that um, we are looking to champion and with, uh, and with county as far as how do we create a trauma-informed community and be able to provide better resources through multiple agencies throughout the county and be more sensitive and trauma-informed uh, in how we approach problems. We also look at other ways of prevention. Um, I mean, when it boils down to it, substance use is a problem of addiction. Addiction is seen as a chronic disease, not necessarily, uh, and not at all a moral failing, but a chronic disease is something that people uh, have um, in that when we treat other chronic diseases such as depression and diabetes, all these affect about 10% of our population. So when we think about treating um, diabetes or um, or depression, we talk about how do we treat those, such as uh, we talk about counseling, we talk about uh, activity, we talk about medication. We do the same thing when we talk about addiction. Ideally, we would love to prevent addiction first. So we look at first at our prevention uh, measures, such as educating our community, what we're doing this evening as far as making you aware of some of the problems. We do have drug take back days where we will gather medications up that are unused, trying to get those out of our community. Um, when it comes to addiction, 
it starts differently for different people. Sometimes it's just opportunity. They find the, the wrong drug, the wrong time, the wrong, the wrong crowd they may be in. They may have a genetic disposition. Why is it that some people can um, have a surgery and take a bottle of pain medication and at the end of it some people are addicted to the pain medication and some people go on without their lives without a bump at all? Um, why is it that um, some people, um, um, you know, we talk about uh, children and what they do in their free time and we talk about trying to get extra medications out of the home so they don't experiment with them. And we talk about things like how do we educate our health care providers to better, um, to better educate uh, all, of, all of our patients as far as how we uh, let them know about the, the potential harm that can come from opioid use. Obviously, you have a problem, you, you need medication for it, but how do we prescribe better pain medication? What are alternative theory or alternative ways to treat pain other than opioids? Um, we also look at things like, um, as I mentioned, getting the drugs out of community. As in your handout, there is a, a drug drop box folder that talks about um, all the ways that you can dispose of unwanted medication. Um, there is one in the sheriff's office, and uh, we encourage people to utilize safe disposition of their, um, of their unwanted and unneeded drugs. Um, Kind of skip that. We also talk about educating our youth, programs in our schools. How do we, again, prevent addiction before it happens? Um, once addiction is already in place, though, we look at treatment. We look at how do we um, provide um, counseling? How do we provide medical assisted treatment? How do we provide uh, activity for people? who um, need that. We've, we know that medication-assisted treatment programs do increase the ability of people to go into long-term recovery. We also look at uh, things like revive programs, providing naloxone. Naloxone is a life-saving medication. It can reverse the effects of opioids and actually bring someone back to life. We can train people in the community on these programs and provide naloxone to the community. Um, we look at recovery courts. How do we um, let law enforcement do their best work as far as uh, sorting out those who are criminals with their drugs versus those who are just merely in the throes of addiction and trying to survive day to day in what they have. Um, we want to increase our community support meetings. How do we better support people who uh, are in recovery with NA and AA meetings and there's a, about a half a dozen other ones now celebrate recovery in different programs that are out there now. Uh, for our NAS work, we work with our hospital on a, a work group as far as providing better community support, wraparound services, plans of safe care. We work closely with our community par partners for uh, NAS um, support and recovery. Um, we want to provide birth control so that families don't have their babies while, uh, until they are prepared and ready to have them. Uh, we also look at, at, at um, disease prevention, such as hepatitis C and HIV, and how can we go about preventing those diseases. Comprehensive harm reduction is a program that has been adopted by the state, whereby you can reduce the, the dirty needles that are in the community. We are able to uh, change out clean needles, clean needles for used needles, and actually does reduce the rates of HIV. HIV and hepatitis C. We also refer, can refer people to mental health and substance use services as well as um, get them vaccinated against other diseases. There are several things in your packet that go over some of these initiatives. Um, there um, is a table for you on um, not only the solutions but some of these uh, uh, some of these solutions that we've talked about. There are tables in here that help you look at the different rates of opioid uh, statistics, including hepatitis C and NAS within our region. Uh, there is a brochure on comprehensive harm reduction as far as what it does entail. And there is also, um, there is a comprehensive harm reduction program currently going on in Smith County. And you can see this and some of the results that are coming from that. Tried to go really fast, I hope that was <laughs> It's been a long night. so. Does anyone ha so I uh, appreciate all the community partners who have worked with this on the community health assessment. Um, this is a document that is online and we can share the link with you. When we look at any of these community implementation plans, having a document such as this helps people when they apply for grants and other funding opportunities to show that the community is working together towards solutions. Uh, when the community works together towards solutions, uh, they are generally uh, better funded by grants because they know that everyone is on board with this and we're all going in the, in the same direction. So we value your input on any of these meetings we'll have in the future as far as implementation ongoing and uh, cherish working with you as far as and all of our other community agencies and I appreciate everyone coming tonight in support of what we're working with for Wythe County. Does anyone have any questions for me? Well, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. It's, you know, it's very sad, obviously, but, you know, we just go day to day and kind of put the blinders on like, I know, I know what's going on in the county, but it's 
very real to hear about it, and I appreciate everything you are doing in all of the agencies because it, it's very sad to see with County being the worst in several things. I was reading the babies being born, and it's just, it's unreal. But thank you. Yeah, we're, for coming we're working toward making it better. Dr. Shelton, your comprehensive harm reduction program in Smith County, who all was that a partnership of? In the so in Smith County, it actually started as a community health assessment. Oh, we looked at substance use was one of our number one things, and we specifically focused on NAC and he NAS and hepatitis C. And Sheriff Schuler there actually was our champion, and he said, there are needles at every arrest that I go to. What we are doing is not working. We're putting the same people back in jail. They're coming out. They're using substances. They're going right back to jail again. What can we do differently to stop this process? And comprehensive harm reduction was new at the time, and we talked about that program. Uh, Wise County was the only one up and going at the time and so we talked about that possibility in Smith County in order for the comprehensive harm reduction to go forward you do have to have um, it is not a, a health department pr program that we just <coughs> set up shop and start doing it is a very structured program that has a uh, very definitive uh, um, structure as far as its intake and what it does it does have to have community support it has to have Board of Supervisors support it has to have law enforcement support in order to go forward but what the comprehensive harm reduction program is, is People can bring in their used needles and they will get clean needles in exchange, but it's more than the needles. They also get harm reduction. We talk to them about uh, all the harms that come about from their substance use. They are more at risk for cellulitis, abscesses, bacterial endocarditis. How do we reduce the harm of the injection? What about HIV and hepatitis C? We look at this community being at high risk, as is the rest of Southwest Virginia, for hepatitis C. When needles are not shared, you don't spread hepatitis C. That can stop some of that disease in the community. Uh, we talk about birth control with them how do you plan for your baby until you're ready most importantly we talk about recovery some of them are interested in recovery some are not at all interested in recovery and some of them the more times they come back they begin to have those discussions we've had just in the one year that the program has been open we've had five people go into long-term recovery already uh, we've had at least 10 reversals within the lock zone to save a life uh, over uh, about a quarter of our people actually work they are working in the community and functioning in this in this way um, over half of them have uh, only actually Actually, only 35% of them do not have health insurance, so many of them have. But we work with them on, um, we have a peer support person, someone who's had personal history of addiction and then has been in long-term recovery. And this person is able to talk with them as a mentor, as far as I've been there where you are. And now I, you know, I'm, I'm working, I have a job, I'm a productive member of society, you can do that too. And it helps people to begin to contemplate going into recovery. People that go to these programs are five times more likely to enter into recovery. So ideally, we would like prevention. We would like to prevent all, all we can from getting into addiction. But for those who are already in addiction, this is a program that meets them where they are. Uh, they don't have to have the goal of recovery when they walk in. They can just come in in their active addiction, and we work with them where they are, get them to begin to value their health. A lot of them haven't had good conversations with people in a long time. They've burned a lot of bridges. And so we just try to get them to value their health, and then some of them will go on toward um, contemplating and, and into recovery. So it's really a program that meets people in addiction and can provide them resources as they're ready to receive them. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you. We thank you. look forward to continue to work you. with you. Thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Next on the agenda is Mr. Andy Fowler of VDOT. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> no, you can stop by the office and I'll, I'll, I'll get you a birthday cake. So. <laughs> Now, I, I feel ill-prepared after that presentation. That was great. Thank you, and thanks for the work you guys are doing. Well, appreciate it. It is appreciated. Um, I'd like to welcome the new board members. Uh, um, I apologize for missing the first meeting. Uh, I had a meeting out of town, and I uh, missed that. But I just want to let you guys know, and you may already know, v VDOT and, and the county have a, a very good working relationship. And... Um, I look forward to working with you guys in the future. And also, you know, I'll, I'll be at these meetings from time to time, but if you guys ever have a constituent need or, or any need whatsoever and you want to contact me, uh, you can get my email address from, from uh, Stephen or give me a call anytime. And um, as the citizens were speaking earlier, I was taking notes. So um, I just want to address a couple of those now. 
to let you guys. Um, let's start with Connors Valley. The citizens have spoke about how nice to meet you guys. And um, I, I, just, a, just a little history. I was just thinking back. Um, I left my role as manager of Big Walker and East River Tunnels back in 2011 and came over to the residency uh, on the, on the um, county maintenance side of the world as far as road maintenance. And in 2011, I was working with one of your neighbors, Mr. George Dunlop. Does he still live in your community? Okay, well, he was very adamant about uh, upgrading Connors Valley Road. And back then, Maggie Poole was on the board. We worked with her closely and Mr. Dunlop, and then uh, continued to work with Mr. Hale after Maggie uh, left the, the, uh, the board. And um, we were looking at a, a couple things. There, there are a couple sections of Connors Valley Road, which obviously you know, are actually below the level of the creek. And um, in, in looking at the issues with Connors Valley, basically we, we work with the county uh, on a, on a six-year plan. And um, we try to build roads in-house uh, utilizing VDOT in-house labor and equipment. And we can do that at, a, at a, a fairly low cost when the roadway is, well, not below a creek, <laughs> to put it bluntly. And so basically what we're looking at with Connors Valley Road, we, well, there's a couple sections that are obviously going to have to be realigned or, or built up. And that is outside the scope of the normal rural rustic uh, method in which we work with the county as, as far as the secondary six-year plan. So I, I, I'm going to have to go back through my files because I know uh, three or four years ago, maybe five, we worked on an estimate on just a ballpark estimate as to what the project would cost but because this, this would actually fall under a design-build concept versus the rural rustic. And, and that involves expensive design and, and then a construction contract to build the road. So what, what I'll do is I'm going to go back tomorrow and, and go back through uh, computer files and, and route files on Connors Valley Road and see if I can find that estimate. Yeah, if I remember correctly, there was even a look at relocating that road higher up on the bank in the process as well. Yeah, there's one section where it is it's probably two feet lower than the creek. Sure. And, and it, it, that, that section runs through, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he yeah. owns the farm no. there. Joe. Yes, yes, Mr. Kelly. And I think at the time Joe was working with Mr. Kelly and, and Mr. Kelly agreed that we could just, we could move the road. I don't remember all the details, there was a lot of negotiations and discussions trying to come with, with possible solutions. Yeah, and I'm sorry to turn my back on yeah, you. You're fine, you go right ahead, don't forget that. But, um, so, I'll, I'm just gonna have to just go back and, and, and look at that again and see where we were on that, see what the estimate was five years ago. It, because basically, I, I know it was in the millions. It, it was very expensive because design builds are, are expensive. But if we can work with Mr. Kelly again and maybe look at some type of alternate solution where somewhere in between rural rustic and, and a full-blown design division build, we could, I'm not going to promise that we can do this, but I want to look into it and see what our options are as far as relocating the road uh, through that one section, like the, there's like a field on both, there's a field on one side and then the creek runs parallel with the road. And so what we were looking at then was moving, relocating the road about 100 yards up or so along the toe of the slope <coughs> and, and therefore getting the road, bringing the road up above the creek level. And so, but obviously that's, that's a pretty good project. So uh, let, me, let me look at that again see where we were on that. I can relay that information to Stephen and can you? Yes, sir. Okay. And so, so that's, that's where we are on Connors Valley. Sure. It's possible that the terrain is changing. Yes, yes. And it's, it, it is a, it's a maintenance issue for, for us because we have quite a few roads that are, you know, they run parallel with, with, with the creek and every time we have these major events, the, the crews are out just hitting one road after 
the next is trying to get those roads back to passable. And so we, we do understand the situation, but um, the funding avenues are, are tricky when it comes to relocating an existing road. So I'll, I'll get the information we've worked on before to Stephen, and then we'll see if we can move forward with or some type of uh, some type of funding or a way to try to take care of the guys' issues. But uh, um, so that's all I have on Connors Valley. And uh, I guess the next next thing would be you you contact them once I get the information to you. And uh, Silence Bridge, the low water bridge that was washed out a few a few years ago. At this point, there is no funding through the bridge division to replace that bridge. And I think that one, did we look at smart scale on that one? Did I look, I don't think looked at smart scale. Um, last May, um, I met with uh, Mr. Reeves, the chairman at that time, and I met with the district uh, residency administrator, Mr. Hamilton, at that time, and a few members of his staff and uh, we even drove down there and, and viewed the site. Uh, Mr. Hamilton indicated they did have some work and design on it and everything, but the problem came down to they did not get any funding through the state level for that bridge. So it had at least advanced to a point of having some design work or whatever on it, but it still was a lack of funding from the state and nothing has changed that I know of, but you may be able to check back with residency and just see if there's any potential for funding in this upcoming fiscal year. I'll check into that. And um, the issue of the road maintenance, the, the <coughs> rutting on the side of the road, I'll, I'll, I'll contact the crews tomorrow and, um, and, and have them evaluate that area. And as you did mention, uh, uh, Pope Road is on the six-year plan and it's, you guys are on deck. <laughs> You're next for, for a surface treatment. So that's, that will occur this summer. That's the happy birthday rule. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as soon as uh, weather breaks, yeah, and we get to where we're not. Um, I mean, we've been lucky so far this winter. Um, we've had a, a few washouts. We haven't had the heavy snows. <laughs> um, we've been lucky so far, but hopefully, you know, once we get past the point, usually the end of March before we really get into starting to remove existing culvert pipes and replacing those pipes. Um, we don't uh, tend not to uh, start projects like that in the middle of winter because the road could just deteriorate terribly if we, if we started a project like that in the winter time. So in other words, that's going to be uh, started probably by one more when the weather breaks. Yes, yes sir. Um, Grouse Ridge, we didn't have any citizens here from Grouse Ridge. No, right. go ahead and give an update just so we can get that on. I think I may have shared the email. We just recently received a board. I don't remember if I did or not. But. Yeah, um, the issue, um, as you may know, or the holdup, let's put it that way, has been between the Attorney General and East Tennessee Natural Gas agreeing on um, subordination, subordination of rights. Yes, which basically, um, as it stands now, East Tennessee uh, natural gas has the right of way where their where their gas line crosses the existing private road, Grouse Ridge Road, and um, there had to be an agreement between East Tennessee and uh, the state of Virginia before the state of Virginia could take the road into the system. E East Tennessee Natural Gas had to relinqu relinquish their right-of-way to VDOT. VDOT has to have primary right-of-way on their road, and then we give permission to utilities to have their utilities within the right-of-way. So the holdup has been, has been that. And so at this point, the AG has reviewed, uh, they've reviewed a submittal uh, from East Tennessee Natural Gas, and long story short, basically it, it looks like they've come to an agreement. And so now the uh, AG's office has approved uh, the submittal from East Tennessee Natural Gas and um, uh, submitted that back to them for their final signature. So at this point, as soon as 
as soon as uh, the final signature is complete and um, we're actually uh, ready to take the road into the system, our office at that point then the road the road would be a state road. So we're going to immediately, and I've already talked with W and L Construction, and I have a milling machine on standby, basically waiting for this uh, this green light to start the road. So as soon as 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 soon as we do get that green light, I'm sending. W and L construction in, and uh, they can start milling the road and get it to where it's in a passable state until we can actually start the project after the weather breaks. Yeah, and but we're on, and in this condition, that road is in that that road is such poor condition that we're not we're not waiting until the weather breaks on this one. We're, we have to get out there and at least mill up that that surface. It's it's well, you know. Right, and that's the concern from the residents down there now. Yes. Uh, I spoke with them last week, and you know, fortunately for them, we've had a fire winter so far. Uh, it's been wet, which has caused problems, but as soon as we can get down there, it's, uh, we need to get, yeah. get on that. So, so it's, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. We're in the starting gates. As soon as we get the, uh, the, the green light to go, we, we will be in there and get that thing where it's passing. Well, well, the gas, I mean, the gas company is the old project. Yes. Yes. Right. I'm not throwing them under the bus. It's just a. It's just a. Mind. It's. It, yeah. <laughs> it's a. It's a legal, a legal red tape nightmare trying to get uh, work through a situation like that where uh, a utility already has the right of way and have they've had that right of way for years and so then they had just had to work through the process of relinquishing the right of way to VDOT. And so who will check with the gas company and make sure that the signatures are being. We're we're in the, we're in an email chain, and Stephen has been very <laughs> adamant about getting information as to where what the status is. And at this point, they know as soon as this thing's approved, we'll get an email. As soon as I got the email yesterday afternoon from VDOT that said this is it's reached an agreement with them, it's got to go back to Enbridge. I copied that email back. I thank VDOT for the good news and copied that email to my contact with Enbridge to say the ball's back in your court, anything you can do, and, you know, so, uh, you know, it, it's, Andy's right, I am a, a perpetual annoyer, and he can go ahead and say it uh, on this project for the last several months to them, but uh, I made certain Enbridge knew that from everything the VDOT said, everything's good, get the signatures and let's go. Hey, if you could just keep me updated on that so I can keep the citizens up there. All right, and I'll take this time to let you guys fire away at me. I got a whole list, Mr. Fowler. Okay. Uh, I will go back to Connors Valley. I know uh, the project, there's a little bit more uh, research that's going to have to be done as far as that, but what about the washouts that they're talking about with the cones? Oh, um, again, yeah, I'll, I'll have the crews okay. go out in the morning and, and, and survey the area. and. <laughs> I'll get them started on, on maintenance on that route if they don't already have it in their schedule. I know there's been uh, Miller's Creek and, and um, Collins Cove. We've had a few roads that have washed out terribly. So, and I know yours, yours is not any less important than those. It's just, they just have to work through a, through a schedule. So, um, but I will mention that road in the morning to the uh, area headquarters. Okay. Uh, so next on my list is Orion Drive. Uh, so, um, you know, I did talk to some of the residents there and, and they're open to what we talked about <coughs> Mr. Byer so uh, if you can give us a prog uh, where we at in the process. Basically uh, Orion Drive was submitted in October or whatever it was for revenue sharing and if I understand basically by later this year by July 1st or whatever we should know if it is awarded funding for revenue sharing. Uh, so once uh, they've scored all those and if you can if you've got any, maybe when, when we can anticipate getting the revenue sharing projects uh, updated as to when they uh, will be funded, uh, then we can go back and talk to the residents about their share and the county committing some money to help uh, finish up that project. And they seem open to it. The, the residents that I spoke to over the last week or so, they're, they're open to that. Uh, Doe Run. And it's probably about a half a mile, it's still uh, gravel. Uh, they're having washouts. Um, it would be good if we could get that road paved. 
uh, for that half a mile there and, and some drainage um, redone to get the water off of some of the residents down there. All right, I think we received a work order on that one late last week, I think. I'll check into that one. And while, um, while we're out there, I'll run out and measure that one up and see if it qualifies for a real rustic build. It may be one we can look at in the future, adding to the plan. <coughs> so then uh, for me, uh, progress report on the major ground, the second or the last part of it there, that we were going to come from Fish Hatchery Road and go back toward the mansion. Where do we stand on that? Um, that one, uh, I, have you been through there lately? I have not. Um, I've, I've been talking with Mr. J.C. Weaver. He owns the mansion, the Fort Chisel, Ma not Fort Chisel Mansion, the Major, Major Graham Grand Mansion. Grand. And he owns the property on both sides of the road for most of that what route that's left to finish. And so he actually uh, volunteered to use his equipment. We, th that road, you know, one of the concerns was the expense of removing the large trees that are within the right of way. Well, not right away, but prescriptive easement, and um, that was that was going to be a big expense to VDOT. That that, as I mentioned before, may have kept us from paving the the, the last or completely paving the last Correct. section. But uh, JC has agreed to and has already started removing those trees with his own equipment. So and he has he's done quite a bit of work, and so um, I'm hopeful that that will enable us to to complete the entire last section with this uh, recent uh, funding. So with that said, the, the tree removal has begun. Okay. So as soon as weather breaks there again, just like uh, with in conjunction with Pope Road, we're starting Major Graham Road. Okay. So it will be it will be completed this summer as well. All right, thank you. Uh, and then Muskrat I know those folks are wanting to do, see if it qualifies for rural rustic. Uh, it's a private drive now. Um. Yeah, it's a private drive. It would have to go through uh, the revenue sharing application and creation of a district. Um, that one would have to run through us before it goes to, to VDOT. Um, if I'm correct, there will not be revenue sharing applications this year, VDOT has taken that to a biannual cycle, if I'm correct, if you will confirm that. But I do think it would be next year before that application would go in. Um, but we can, um, what we would like to do is, is um, get contact information with you and, and maybe look at having a community meeting over there or here or where we can meet with them and talk about the steps that they would need to go through and, and how the tax district could work if that's the route they want to go and at least uh, begin the process of getting them ready to submit a revenue sharing application. Okay. And then the last one I got, Mr. Fowler, is uh, Route 94, uh, the speed limit from 52 through the S curves right below St. Paul Church. I think the speed limit's 45 through there. Uh, the residents have been complaining, especially the folks on the right, if you're going back toward Avenue. Um, that lives on the hill and the curve, there's no vision there when you pull out those driveways. Uh, so they, they would like to see the speed limit drop to 35 through that stretch of road. Intersection of 52 to? Back toward south on uh, 94 through the S curves all the way to right below uh, St. Paul Church or Jewel Drive. Yeah, I was trying to think of that. What was that? Jewel Drive comes off of 94 there. I'll pass that along to our traffic engineering folks. Yeah. See if it, see if they'll survey that for us. Right. Appreciate it. I'm done. <laughs> well, that's all the time I have. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing. Uh, no, I don't believe I have anything. Um, I haven't heard anything from the citizens in my area, and I. I try to, you know, drive around and make sure everything looks good, so I'm good to go. Thank you. Mr. Fowler, uh, crawfish, uh, I, I know they dump gravel 
Yes, Gaffer Ridge. Um, Gaffer Ridge, they, they've had at least one or two more accidents in that one section that I believe we were here that night. Uh, we right. spoke out of the way. Besides putting on the six year plan, unless they lease some money, I'm not sure what we can do. With it. Yeah, they um, can't put guardrail on stabilized road, but we, we can, has the slope failed at all? Have, have we had any I erosion? Have, I haven't been down there in a while. Um, Mr. Wright had sent me a message probably a month, month and a half ago, um, and, and I think he understands what we're dealing with. It's more of an and I thought I'd, I'd let you know. I'll, I'll ride through and look at it and see if the road, if the, the slope has eroded any and made the road more narrow than it was. And Mount Airy Road, what's Yeah, they, they started that one late in the season last year, last fall, as far as um, installing pipe and, and pre preparing that one for the surface treatment. But as soon as weather breaks there again, that, that, that one will be because completed. Because they're really excited because they've seen it. Work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's always hard when we start one in the fall because you can't finish stop, it. Yeah. That's all I have. And, um, tell your people um, we had an accident down here on West Lee um, Friday. Friday, um, and they they do a really good job. It's a bad accident, but. Uh, Mr. Leffler and Larry Cook Foster. Yeah. Uh, really good job. It's, I always say this. I know you don't hear it often. We appreciate it. Thank you. And, and actually, that that one turned out to be uh, pretty sad for VDOT because yeah. the fatality was actually one of our operators from the Marion Area Headquarters. Mm -hmm. Robert, mean done. <laughs> Thirty-five mile an hour zone, I have enough. Yeah, that one is in process. It's it's under review now, okay. so uh, traffic engineering is working on that. Yeah, and they good. and uh, we've given traffic engineering our the residency support for that. Uh, we we agree that it should be extended, but uh, once they've done their their traffic study, then we'll know the results of that. So. I'll be good. I won't ask you nothing there. I don't have anything, believe it or not. <laughs> what? I think mine were covered. <laughs> People cover me. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Smith covered too that I was going to ask about, so thank you very much, Mr. Fowler. Okay. All right. They're going to go that easy on me tonight. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I was just going to say, I don't want to take a five minute recess. <laughs> Madam, Madam Chairman has uh, gave me a look. So we'll be in recess for five minutes. Yeah. Calls back into the session. I've done that on purpose. I don't want to see this party. <laughs> <laughs> Next on the agenda is resolution 2020-01, the cigarette tax legislation. Mr. Bayer, if you'll summarize that. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, last year, if you'll remember, we, for those that were here, sorry, those that were here, we, we passed a similar resolution last year. Uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, has been working uh, for several years on trying to get equal taxing authority between cities, counties, and towns. 
and in, in unable to get equal taxing authority uh, for all aspects of it to at least get uh, the ability to impose a local tax on cigarettes since the health department's here for health department for health reasons and also for economical reasons as well. Um, Mr. Stirrup uh, that we uh, are working with from the Revenue Equity Coalition uh, did recommend that we uh, adopt a resolution this year showing the, the new board support for the ability to for counties to <coughs> levy a local tax on cigarettes. So what you have before you is a, a resolution to that effect. Um, and staff would recommend the adoption of this resolution. Accept the uh, motion to adopt resolution 2020-01. So move that motion. I'll second it then. Have a, have a motion to second any discussion. We we'll roll call vote, Mr. Smith. Aye. 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 Resolution adopted 7 0. Draft budget calendar fiscal year 2021. Mr. Chairman, we, we are required to uh, adopt a budget calendar. Uh, I've emailed this to all of you all. Uh, I have revised the week of the board, <coughs> present, board budget presentations to the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, which I think works out with everyone's schedule. Uh, and uh, the goal here is to adopt this at a budget by our May 26, 2020 meeting. Please note, schedule can be changed in the future, but I would uh, request the adoption of this for our uh, budget calendar for, this fiscal, for the upcoming fiscal year. Mr. Smith, I know you had a conflict with the dates. These dates were. Ten and have a motion to adopt the, Six, the 16th, 17th, and 18th are no longer, we're Correct. not going to use those. Correct. Okay. Are you still, the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, are we still starting at 8? Be generally scheduled 8 to 5 on all three of those days. Okay. What's, what time works best for you? 5 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Five o'clock. I don't know. I mean, I was just if it had started at nine, I was going to say I could possibly get a sub for that evening, and I could drive in the mornings. Uh, I've got a sub that does that quite a bit, but she may be tied up on another route, so it may not make any difference. We're going to try to do them all within the three-day period, and I would say in doing so, it probably will be a pretty tight schedule throughout. I, I would say it started at least by eight thirty each yeah. morning. We'll, we'll see what we can get done. We'll be here. Anybody else? Have a motion to adopt draft list calendar. I make that motion, Mr. Chair. Have a motion, have a second. Second. Have a motion, have a second. Do a roll call vote, Mr. Terry. Aye. 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 Woodfield Fire Department Chief Mark Brady. He must have been following along. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two things. One, um, Mr. Barrier, I believe, is in possession of a resolution that would identify the Town of Woodfield Fire and Rescue Department uh, to have the capabilities to run EMS calls in Wythe County. It's a formality that the state requires from us, um, but it's certainly something that you all would have to approve prior to uh, us being able to run EMS in with County. Um, it's slightly important. Otherwise, um, we can't really move forward with the plan that we're looking at. Um, second part is, uh, can I approach? Yeah. Um, how did we get to kind of where we're at right now? Um, months ago, uh, with County, Rescue Squad's board approached me uh, and the fire department because I had shown interest in Sorry. running PMS calls. In other words, a combination department. Um, we've come a long way since then. Uh, 
So there's been kind of some back and forth, certainly with the prior board and uh, now with the current board. So I wanted to be able to present uh, kind of how we came up with some of the financial requests that we did. Um, so if you look on the first page, it's uh, basically a little bit of a history page. Uh, just over a year ago, uh, the fire department consisted of five to six engineers and 11 volunteers. Uh, after midnight, the engineers were on call and there was no one at the firehouse. As a result, our response times were upwards of 10 to 15 minutes after midnight. Uh, mutual aid consisted of the engineer and typically one other person. In other words, not a full crew. If you flip the page with the commitment that the town of Withville elected officials <coughs> are giving us, um, we're going to have approximately 35 employees. We will have eight to nine people per shift. We will have 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day a year coverage. And our response times, certainly within the town, will be less than five minutes. How does this affect with county residents? Well, clearly 15 minutes to get to the station, pick up an apparatus, and then go to the call, even in the outskirts of our coverage area, could be upwards of 30 minutes. Uh, in a working structure fire, 30 minutes is a result of whether you save the house or you save the foundation in reality. Your house is, it could start in a kitchen and within 30 minutes the whole house will be easily engulfed. So get, certainly getting someone there on time uh, or faster is a huge benefit. Um, when you look at adding uh, the budget on the next page, the, uh, the estimated budget for 2021 for the Town of Withville Fire and Rescue Department will be about $2.5 million. Last year, With County gave us approximately $21,480. So if you subtract those numbers, the Town of Withville has approximately 8,211 citizens, the town of Withville is investing about $306 per citizen per year into the fire department and EMS department. That figure, EMS only and not fire only. That, this is fire only. Fire only. Fire only. If you flip the page, the town of Withville fire department covers approximately 5,000 with county residents. I know we're all with county residents, but outside of the town of Withville. With the $21,480 that you gave us last year, that's $4.30 per citizen per year that is invested. We're trying to narrow that gap a little bit. For the town to initially take over EMS, the town is investing $624,305. That's just before we even run a call. So what I've asked is $150,000 the first year, which is $30 per citizen per year. Second year, $125,000, which is $25. And you can see $100,000 every year after, which is approximately $20 per person per year. Those are, that's fire coverage only. When you look at the next page, the map, we're proposing the same coverage areas as the town of Withville Fire Department currently covers and With County Rescue Squad currently covers. The town of Withville ran the most call, Town of Withville Fire Department ran the most calls last, year's, that last year than any other department at 380. Same thing with With County Rescue Squad, they ran 2,554 calls last year. Clearly that's gonna be the Town of Withville Fire and Rescue Department running those calls. So if you flip the page, 
All of Wythe County ran 6,018 calls last year. As a result, by adding both departments together, the Town of Withville Fire and Rescue Department will cover almost 50% of the, all the calls in Wythe County. I would strongly encourage the board to look at making adjustments based on call volume and coverage area versus everybody gets the same amount of money. I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have, but understand that the Town of Withville Fire and Rescue Department is not just available to the Town of Withville. It is available to the entire county. <clears throat> and we will always keep it that way. <clears throat> Chief, on, on the EMS side, um, and we discussed a little bit of this last night in the fire rescue on your what's the what's the billing practice going to be the billing practice is going to be the exact same that is currently at with county rescue squad clearly we're going to go with a different billing company um, but the collection process is going to be the same there will be no changes now when you refer to rates the state does set a rate of what you can charge they also set a rate for mileage and those types of things so you're basically looking at what we call bls transport the state sets a rate for that then you have als one the state the state sets a rate for that and the same thing with als two those types of things and i guess you know, the, the number one question we citizens every time this is all up kind of what I was uh, what, what happens if somebody can't pay? Uh, we send them inevitably three letters. Well, there's two pro there's a program that I'm also putting in place that would be available to the with County residents. And that's basically a membership. In other words, for $200 a year, each household could buy into this membership. And for lack of a better term, what we do is we still bill your insurance company. But if there's any additional fees that aren't covered, then all those fees go away. And it covers a household. It's not just one person. Air rescue. Yeah. Similar to the air rescue, yes. Um, and, and that's, you know, I know that uh, they don't like to give the term hard bill, but I mean, are we? No, are sir. We're not, we are not hard billing. Are taking people to court? Or no, are sir. No, sir. And on your, You've got the town of Whitfield's investing 624.305 to assume the EMS, and then the town's requesting 150,000 first year. What what value do you put on? You, you left off what the county's uh, the equipment that's been in discussion, the trucks, the you know. Well, when you look at when you look at the actual apparatus or the transport units, uh, the county doesn't have a whole lot of money invested in those. Is that accurate? They were both of them were bought on grants. One of them was a 100% grant, and the other one was a 50, started out as an 80-20 and went to 50-50? There, we have budgeted for it to be an 80-20, but yes, they got a 50-50 grant on it, yes. So in reality, the county doesn't have a whole lot of money invested in the medic units. Doesn't make them worth any less, though, does it? 
Um, I mean, there's certainly, we have one out of service right now for, for mechanical issues. Um, again, based on the grants that they, were, that they were accepted through, they do have to stay in the area to serve the citizens of that locality. But if you had to go buy new trucks, that cost would come to, to you, right? Eventually, yes. When we do replace those apparatus, <coughs> the, the transport units, yes, that will be through. Right, but I mean, you're, you're saying <coughs> that there, there's no value there, but if, if the county wasn't looking to. No, it certainly helps out. Right. It, it's, it, it's, a, it, it's a huge savings in, in regards to we, have, we would have to try and figure out what the value of those are based on, you know, the money that the county has invested in it and how much those app those vehicles are worth we certainly have put the offer out on the table that we would be interested in purchasing those transport units should that be something that and i think the point you would agree if you had to go out and buy two units new right now you'd be spending between four or five hundred thousand dollars agree and you know roller trade just got word yesterday they did not get approved for a rescue squad unit so that is a rescue squad unit. If we weren't conveying to you all, we could offer it to real retreat or something like that. But obviously the goal has been to work together on this. And I think that's the point. There's value in those assets that have been transferred also. And I think based on you know the, the last agreements and everything, I think everything is real close to the agreements of everyone to, to come forward on. Uh, we just get those finalized and be ready to move forward. Right. And when I when you look at the figure for the six hundred and some odd thousand dollars that's prior to us running a single call uh, in order to get personnel on board uh, I have to bring them in I have to buy all their equipment the equipment alone is uh, is fifty four thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars just for gear helmets and so forth when you look at I have to train them prior to them coming that's all before we can even run a single call with them. Is now, there is something I certainly want to bring to your attention, and that is that with County Rescue Squad is very close to shutting the doors. As in any day, they will not be able to run 911 calls anymore. They're having trouble paying their bills. I was approached uh, last week that they're not sure that they're gonna make payroll. And you all know as well as I do that if you don't make payroll, people are just not gonna work for you. We are starting to put together a contingency plan that I've already hired some paramedics that have worked for me for over a year that we can certainly add to their capabilities of running calls in the event that someone doesn't show up from the rescue squad staffing wise um, my division chief is a paramedic i'm a paramedic and we have every expectation that we're going to be riding on medic units until we get the, this thing taken care of our goal is that this transition has zero impact on the citizens does have to shut down within a week and you all have a, a start date estimated for around one March 9th. we well we have the employees new employees will be showing up on february 10th okay for, for training yes okay. yeah if we're in a situation could you all i mean i know this this would involve the town and this would involve a lot but are we in any type of situation to where we can move your startup date sooner and we can do what we have to do to make sure that the citizens have EMS? We're certainly, we're right there to being close. close. Certainly the resolution that we presented is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I can't promise, but I can tell you that we'll, we will have either that and or a contingency plan in place. And that's really what you're all talking about. I just, I just want to know for myself where we would be with that. Because it's very and, scary. And that's critical. Um, it's very the, critical. The, the, 
the whole goal was with County Rescue Squad being able to stay up and running until the time came to, to turn this over. Um, unfortunately, um, as he said, they contacted him last week. Unfortunately, I just got word this afternoon that they were in this financial situation. Uh, you know, had it been last week, we would have been trying to come up with some things to look at to address, talking to the town on the entire agreements where we were, uh, looking at financially things we can do um, with that. So, it, it, but the whole goal here, because you know, I don't want to have to go to a situation of them shutting down and us having to bring in another outside agency as another designated emergency response in here or something like that. Uh, we are so close to having this worked out of transferring everything over to the town. Uh, I would like to see us, uh, you know, as quick as we can in the next week or so, get everything finalized on these agreements so that everything can be ready. To yeah, and, that, and that's what I was getting at. Either, you know, us as a board, it's our responsibility to either take money out of our funding and fund the rescue squad to keep them afloat for the six weeks or whatever it takes, or we can just go ahead and move forward with this as quickly as possible and, you know, it's, it's going to cost no matter what, and it's what's best for the citizens. So. Yeah, agree. Well, what, you know, what, one of the, the product that we're putting out there for the citizens, we're talking pennies on the dollar. I mean, you, you, you're going to get a fully staffed career fire and EMS department 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we're talking about pennies on the dollar. I mean, instead of you know, it being one cent per citizen per year, I'm asking for 10 cents. Mr. Baer, is that resolution, did you say it's a draft right now? Did I miss that uh, email? Well, their attorney drafted one and sent to us. Uh, Curtis has marked it up. What I'd like to do is, is get it in the format, and he's got some things there. We are recessing until tomorrow night, and what I'd like to do is have Curtis opportunity to put that because we have the designated emergency response add them in there as an agent in that form that we have and uh, get and maybe if you all don't care to either recess from that meeting and come up here tomorrow night to just go over that where we are maybe Mr. Sutherland and I can get tomorrow together tomorrow and we can talk about where we are on this agreement as well Mr. Brady and whoever see how close we are to get all of those things worked out because I really don't want to have to go to other agencies or other <coughs> agencies or whatever uh, in the process and, and unfortunately with the status of where with county rescue squad is um, you know we, we need to study that a little more tomorrow and look at some options we've got on that for for those of us that are new on the board and aren't really up on this a whole lot uh, between now and then could you uh, send me something that addresses these open areas of the county that aren't covered because I mean we're giving them the equipment and I'm just wondering you know, you've got the so east end and the west end of the county that are wide open. That, those are covered by landmines sure. and rural retreat. So his map is just showing the area that the town of Whitfield fire and rescue would be covered. And that they would they would keep the same coverage area that we have currently with the county rescue squad instead of um, just airing it down to just town limits. Okay. Right. That's right. Any other questions that I can answer? Audio. Certainly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Brady. Staff report, county administrator. Sure. Mr. Chairman, uh, one item on agenda, and I realized it was going to be a, a long meeting, so I didn't put a lot of additional items on there. Uh, this, what you have in front of you is a draft capital improvements program. Uh, I shared this and reviewed this with the budget committee um, last week on this. Basically, as we're going into the upcoming budget, um, it's important for us to implement and put in a capital improvements uh, plan just sort of as a guide over uh, the next uh, five years of our expenditures. The, um, this is broken down between county office buildings, economic development, recreation, emergency operations, um, refuse collection, and it goes on down water, wastewater, a lot of different areas. Um, 
this is all two things. One, it's it's just sort of a guideline to help frame where we have capital expenditures. Secondly, um, the, the budget committee uh, we talked about bringing in an outside firm to look at providing a financial overview and planning uh, for us. Uh, I met with the gentleman, two gentlemen today, uh, from the company. They were passing by. They were on their. They think they had either met with Bland. Uh, I think Bland is taking some action on tonight on on bringing their services in, and then they were going to visit other localities in Southwest Virginia that they're currently doing some work for. And uh, what I talk with them about is, is presenting us the proposal to do the overview of our financial situation, to do the overview of our water and sewer in particular, to look at if there's any avenues of uh, refinancing, consolidating debt in those areas that could help us as well uh, with, with trying to bring our balance more in line on our, our water and wastewater accounts. Um, so I did meet with them today. They will be uh, getting a proposal together to, to, to meet in the next couple days. But as they're looking at expenditures of the county, they've got our history, they've got our budgets currently, but they need a little bit of guidelines of what we're looking at in the next five years as potential expenditures. And so what I have here is, is a, a document uh, that I, I would like to see you all adopt, if not tonight, at least in the near future, for uh, capital improvements plan for the county. Uh, and it doesn't lock them down in stone. Every year you all still got to amend or you all still got to approve and appropriate budgets. But it gives a guideline out there of, of doing those projects. So. At this hour, I will not take everyone's time of trying to go through them unless you all want me to, but I'll be glad to answer any questions that anyone has on any of them. I, I know the budget committee seen it. Um, does everybody want to look at it on their own time? And feel free to call me. If anybody's got any questions about any of it, you can call me. Um, there's certainly plenty of time and to adopt this at the next meeting. I would like to adopt about the next meeting no later than the second meeting in February, um, just so that uh, the company can have this as a guideline to go off of. You will see there are water projects in there. We know that we have challenges with water projects, but we have to plan for capital improvements for some of these water projects. Maybe we can get grant funding. Maybe we can't. Maybe they, they don't happen, but we do have them in there. Um, fire departments, there's, there's money in there for replacing fire trucks in the upcoming year. That came up in fire and rescue last night of some trucks that need to be replaced in the near future. Uh, school construction is in there. Uh, obviously, we know the school has got capital improvement meetings going on right now, uh, but we also know we've got money coming I say free. We've got debt service money that been paid off. It frees up debt service money for 2023, 2024 uh, for keeping us at the same level of debt funding. So anyway, just those are in there. I welcome your comments, questions, uh, and we can put this on the agenda for the next meeting. Anything else? Okay. No, sir. County Attorney. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a couple updates. Uh, Hamilton's Knobs Tower site uh, received an email yesterday from the Enbridge people. He said he gave us a like a company resolution authorizing the transfer of the land to the county, and their legal department is reviewing the deed. And I think he said by the end of the week he hoped to have comments back to me for the draft deed. So that's moving, not as fast as we want, but it's moving. Um, the other thing. Uh, the only other thing to report on, I believe the committee met on the parking ordinance and provided comments back to me through the administrator, which I need to revise and send back to the administrator of the committee for them to make a recommendation, I guess, to the board on that. Uh, but that's all I have at this time. Unless anyone has any questions. Anybody have any questions? Okay. We're, we're, we're going to have to separate. <laughs> <laughs>
Board of Supervisors time, Mr. Smith. I've got several. One, I'll just talk about one. It's pretty present. Uh, got some residents on Lots Gap. Uh, the the recent grading at Salem Stone at the top of the mountain. There's a uh, stormwater runoff, and it's getting in, hitting them pretty hard. Uh, so the one gentleman said you couldn't walk through his backyard to take his shoes off. So if we can look at that. Yeah, this is not a long beat up road or whatever. This is <coughs> no, property it's, to property. Yeah, it's property to property. Okay. That's it. No, sir. Have nothing. I don't want to talk no more. Mr. Ford, uh, the only thing I've had, and it's, it's a complaint, but it's kind of come a roundabout way to me. Uh, evidently, they have wharf rats in Speedwell now, and they think it's because of the feedlot. Mm. <laughs> uh, and our health department said that it's nothing, not their problem, which I really don't understand. I mean, I thought rats would be a health problem, but... I don't know if we need to, if there's anything we can or need to do. I think they were in England on the time. They would? <laughs> they were in England. That's all I think I have. Mr. All I've got is I would like to know how the town of Withful knew our rescue squad had a problem before we did. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm serious. We're sitting here completely. And Stephen was blindsided too, found out today. I mean, where's the breakdown of communication at? Uh, and and there's accountability. Their exactly. And their yeah, uh, they, uh, the long term solution is out there. Yes. Where we're going. Mm. Uh, it's just a little disheartening. This the Board of Supervisors has worked so hard and supported with County Rescue Squad and helped them out. Um, and I know the entire change is hard because not everyone there knows that they'll get a job working for the town and some people may be left out and everything else. Um, but there, unfortunately, it, it has been sort of a breakdown and it does make it a little bit more difficult when one or two, when, you know, the chairman of their board is a town employee, town employee that works directly under Mr. Brady and so it, it, it sort of muddies the the reporting lines and everything else of what's been going on. So, uh, you know, we just need to get this finalized so we can, can move forward. Well, that was what I was going to speak about. I, I'm all for it. My only hang up is the first two years. Uh, what, what their request of the 150000 $125,000, i am all for $100,000 a year. And that, that's a prime example. Of, you know, I don't feel like they gave us credit for what that was. Agreed. Annuals that they were. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think we're all on the same page, Mr. Fall. Well, I mean, basically, right now we give them what fifty thousand dollars round about. Well, if you sixty thousand combined, it's seventy. Yeah, probably, yeah. two. Yeah. Seventy-three, seventy-two, seventy-three combined. Yeah. So you know, it's obviously going to be a very what the town is building and what they're doing is be a very responsive agency, and, and the fire and rescue and, and what come out there is just. Um, it's not come together as easily as what it possibly could have. We'll get there. I, w I will say that I do feel that with all of the startup costs, that the first year maybe we can do a little bit better than 100000 even with the rescue squad, because there is a lot of startup costs. But moving, and I'm not even saying the 150. i am saying maybe we can negotiate something between 100 and 150. Well, a lot of that, a lot of that startup cost is by equipment, which they're not going to have to buy because we're also giving it to them. Giving it to them, okay. yeah. And it's also training, which if they hired with County Rescue Squad members there, wouldn't they already be trained? I didn't quite understand that. Yeah. So, 
So maybe we, you know, I've been through all of the meetings, and you know, Coy, you have. So I mean, maybe we need to really sit down with Mr. Brady as a full board before we make this this decision, even though it's very urgent. You know, maybe we can ask those questions about the training and about the equipment so well, that we can make a good decision. And I think there's a combination of training. I think you're going to have EMT people that are going to go through firefighter one training and you're going to have, you know, where, where they're having all cross trained staff and all that. So, and I don't know what all steps and procedures they've taken and set up, but they can certainly share that with us. I'm just saying I'm, I'm open to the first year that it might cost a little bit extra. I'm open to that to learn more about it. Other than that, year two through however many, 100,000 is what I would look at. The other question is going to be the debt and the account receivable that's coming in. And if they take that, there's going to be debt involved, but there's also going to be, every call that Wood County's ran, which they're behind on getting those calls, if they get that money in, it would be going to the town, I guess, at that point. Okay. And I think the fairest thing on that is to assume all debt and assume all the receivables that are sitting out there and move forward and on. And that's, that's how the agreement's drafted right now. Okay. So we'll see. Well, we don't get any credit for the equipment, and we've still got two areas that we have that we're responsible for buying equipment. Right. Yeah. I mean, if we don't give it to the town, we can use it in the other area. So I think we should at least get some credit for those things. Oh, I agree with that. But don't we give us credit? They don't give us credit. What if we give them 150,000 bucks and tell them to go buy their own ambulances? Well, I mean, he kept, <laughs> he, well, he kept talking about the 600 plus thousand that the town's doing. Then he started talking about the train and the equipment. That if, if that's not included in that 650 whatever thousand, it should have been. I yep. mean, it's that that's that's where we get in the shape that we're in as a county because you got projects that's not complete, and then you come back nickel and dime and and that gets people all riled up. We need to stop that. Agreed. So it's, it's, it's all in or none. Well, and, and also this, this is for a five-year agreement. You know, is there any calls for extension? Or so the one-year extension. In the so, you know, six-year agreement. Well, by year six, those ambulances are going to be shot. Uh, yeah. And when we renegotiate, If they've got a four million dollar budget six years, you know, where are they going to want out of camping? Yes. So if we can save seventy five thousand dollars here, we may need it six years. I agree. Yeah. Because the people have no leverage. Anything else? Mr. Chairman, I had scheduled the health department and the uh, accountants when I was still assuming that we would be meeting during the day, so my apologies for having long presentations on, uh, on the evening meetings, but uh, thank you all for your patience tonight. We don't, we are not going into closed session. Just, no. Um, well, why not? We haven't been here this long. Does anybody have anything else? I don't have to drive a bus till 6 o'clock in the morning. I mean, come I on, baby. I done got over yeah. my hunger, baby. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Barry, do you have anything else? No, sir, Mr. Chairman. Y'all have a good evening. Millie. We'll see you everybody tomorrow night. Mr. Chairman, 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 Mr.